Hey, everybody. Welcome to our second edition of Tone Talk. How are you? I'm Mark Uzanski, and I'm here tonight with Dave Friedman also on the show with us. Dave, Hello. how are you? I'm good. I'm really good. Good to see you. And we have an excellent guest tonight, George Metropolis from Metropolis Amplification. How are you, man? Mighty fine. What's happening, guys? Doing good. Doing good. I'm uh, starting my vacation tonight. Ha. Huh. Oh, That's you're awesome. taking a vacation? Well, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just hanging low. It's a staycation. Oh, are you actually off for a while? I'm off for a week, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Nice. To recover and plan that show? What's that? So you can recover and plan the next show? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Always have to do uh, lots of work output. He's going to be bored. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I probably will be bored by the end of the week, but I just need I just needed a, a break. But this is awesome to have you on the show, George, to have both you guys on the show, Dave and, and George. You guys are well, uh, I'm always on the show. I know you're always on the show. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying I from a, know if I, can follow, I don't think I can follow Grover. That guy's a legend. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. And really, last week, uh, two weeks ago, when Dave said you can come on and talk about scotch, it was pretty much over right then. <laughs> exactly. I knew, I knew that would get you. <laughs> you might as well have just said, hey, George, come on. <laughs> I think he was thinking of you as he said it. I think that's basically what it was. Absolutely. I, hope, I introduced him to scotch. Yes, you did. And, uh, and, and my wallet has hurt more ever since. <laughs> well, you introduced me to Chiba Sushi, and so now I have to be in Michigan. To well, that, that well, it hurt much more after that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Chiba Sushi. Why? Well, I, I haven't had that. What am I missing? Oh, yeah. Well, next time you're out here. Okay. Oh, what am I missing? missing? You're missing if you like sushi. I love sushi. Love sushi. Well, you haven't actually had sushi yet. Uh, it's the best I've ever had anywhere. Really? Well, I mean, what, what's the distinction? Not well, to take us down. Okay, caveat, I haven't been to Japan. Right. So, you know. I have. It's better. <laughs> it redefines sushi. It really does. Huh. Can you only find it in, in California, or is it anywhere? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, no, it's a, it's a restaurant here uh, in uh, North Hollywood, actually. Oh, and that's the that's the name of the place, Chiba yeah. Sushi. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chiba. Yep. Gonna have to go. Definitely. That, for anyone actually in in Los Angeles, if you have not gone there, go there. <laughs> oh wait, what am I saying? Don't go there. It's crowded enough already. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, no, it's not any good. It's no good. It's no good at all. Yeah, read the reviews. <laughs> They're horrible. That's funny. <laughs> How's that, Dave? Huh? They built the new building, or they moved into the bigger building. How is it? How is that? Way more crowded. Oh, really? <laughs> bigger and more crowded. So, hmm. yeah. So you know, <laughs> well, I just had some last night. Oh, really? I think I yeah. yeah I, I think I saw a picture. Yeah. No, my 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 wife went last night, but she brought me home a little care package from there. Okay, so. yeah, I think that's where I I saw someone had a picture of some really good looking sushi. But then again, I I also feel, I think I see Pete Thorne sometimes with some really great pictures. I'm like, I think he may go there too, right? Uh, he goes there sometimes. Uh, we uh, and he goes to several other spots too that he likes that that are quite good also. Yeah. Very cool. We got a lot of a lot of talk in the uh, in the chat. I just saw Craig Rundles is here. Very cool. I wonder if he's uh, in Russia right now. He lives in St. Petersburg. Um, oh wow! Yeah, yeah, oh. nice and far. Greetings. Yeah, he actually builds the um, the Bones guitars for uh, the ones that George Lynch. Yeah, right on. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Craig is cool. He came to Florida. He was bass fishing. We got to hang out. We didn't get the drink. Unfortunately, but um, by the way, I was saving this for you guys. My daughter brought this home from college. I was wondering, do you think I should? Uh, what do you think of this? Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what is that exactly? Wait, it says uh, Boozeman. 
Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Boozeman, uh, take one shot orally every 10 minutes or as needed. Um, yeah. yeah, you should really do that. It's actually a real so, flask. Would you imagine? It's actually a real flask. But <laughs> that's, that's, George, that's George's size. That's subtle. <laughs> <laughs> that's, you know, that's George's size. Yeah. And it's uh and, and, and does your daughter actually have one also that she used in college? No, this is the one that she has. This is the one she brought home. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's it's by Dr. Al Kaholic. That's the doctor right there. Excellent, excellent. Yep, yep. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he's related to Dr. McGillicuddy. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Just to throw a commercial in while we're getting started here, I only use Dr. McGillicuddy's elixirs for my daily medicinal whiskey needs. <laughs> you, you actually bought that, right, just for the saying on it, right? Oh, hold on, I have a little cough. I, I better, I have to medicate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Wow, what's that taste like? Uh, like a blueberry grew in a pile of garbage. <laughs> awesome. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure I go out and buy a bottle. If you like Kool-Aid mixed with NyQuil, you're on the right track. Ah, that's kind of like what we used to drink when I was in high school, like MD 2020, I think. Yeah, it's right up that. Mm -hmm. Right there. It's got a way Very cooler similar. name. It does, actually. Yeah. Name's better. Can you see the mirror? I don't know if you can read it. The Dr. McGillicuddy's mirror in the back? I can. See it. Yep, I yep, can, yep. I, yep. I'm shooting for an endorsement. Help me out. Come on, Dr. McGillicuddy's. <laughs> now, does that have any um, relation to, because whenever I hear McGillicuddy, it always reminds me of uh, Lucy and I Love Lucy, right? Isn't that, oh, right. wasn't there McGillicuddy with I Love Lucy? Oh, Mrs. McGillicuddy or something? Or I, Mr. I, I, uh, something? It just, know, it's in my subconscious. If I need a nickname for somebody, I always call him such and such McGillicuddy or, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I've known a friend I've known for probably 25 years who's seen that mirror and stole it for me off a wall somewhere. That's and then, great. Then he was at a liquor store and seen the bottle. He's like, oh, so perfect. We're getting this. <laughs> By the way, uh, George, I love the, uh, the background you got there. Yeah, this is my my fun room. I wish I spent more time here. Spent all my time. Boy. In the this is where I should be hanging out all the time. The whole not most of the gangs here. There's more cabs and heads out in the barn. But now, are those vintage? Those reissues? I should dare I ask? Are those vintage? Oh yeah, of course. No reissues in this show. Oh, vintage. All vintage. <laughs> no, no reissues allowed. I know. I dare. I should have. I should have known when I said that. But yeah, yeah. Well, That's you know, to get this going though, a little bit further here, we have to do a, an unboxing video, and and it's not a striped guitar or anything, but it's very important. We have we have the Belvini twelve year double wood. So I want to unbox this so I can. Uh, yes, and George has the same. We want to unbox these so we can actually have some. Now, we didn't talk about this beforehand. I went and got this. Dan got scotch in his own, and we compared notes just about 20 minutes ago. We both had the same. And I'm proud of you. This is my, my favorite scotch. So I splurged on this for the show. Yeah, we did not talk about this, actually. This, nope. isn't, this isn't set up. <laughs> nope. Brand new. Nectar of the gods here. Wow. So we all... Bought. Have the same Belvini. We've all got the same. Double wood. <laughs> Double wood. So we've got basically triple wood right here. Yeah, I guess we have triple wood, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all right, right so now we can really start the show. All right. Okay, so now, now scotch whiskey for the uninitiated. Scotch is only whiskey. <laughs> so it's about scotch. So. <laughs> yeah. What I want to talk. What do you want to talk about? We'll talk amp. We'll talk amps maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we've got always do that. Scotch whiskey is whiskey that can only be made in Scotland, of course. Mm -hmm. Can only have three or four ingredients, and one of those is water, Scottish water. 
uh, one other major ingredient is uh, malted barley. Also has to be sourced in Scotland. Mm. So there's only a few things you can put here. You can add a little color. Uh, but when you taste scotches, if you tasted 10 different scotches, they would all taste different. And there's several different regions that produce different types of scotches, different uh, flavors of scotches. You've got Highland scotches, like uh, uh, was it uh, Glen Morangi is a Highland, mm -hmm. uh, the Bell, the Glenlivet, the Glenfiddich, Macallan. Those are uh, Speyside scotches, and that's a little region on the east of Scotland. That's right on the on the bulk of the uh, sea there, and they tend to produce my favorites, the more sort of complex, a little bit sweeter, not as peaty, not as smoky a little smoother and uh it's worth just noting before we crack this and have some this is a space side and this is aged 12 years and they call it double wood because it spends the first 12 years or so in a uh a whiskey cask or i think it's right or rum and then they, they transfer it to a sherry cask mm -hmm. and so when they finish it off it adds a complexity and a sweetness and a little bit of a sparkling sort of a character to it. So cool. And just to add to that, well, let's take, let's take the, let's take the drink first and then I'll, cause I, my buddy of mine, he sent me a whole bunch of stuff on, maybe we won't even cover that. Yeah. Screw that. Let's just drink. <laughs> <laughs> you could talk all day about scotch and over analyze it, but it's not necessary because you could just, Take a whip and have a sip and know really everything you need. Now, the thing is, it reminds me of when I was a kid. I got to say, I'm not much of a drinker of this, so. Um, it still has that bourbon smell, whiskey smell, but I think you can, before I even, t t you know, touch it, but. So, and, and there's a reason for that. And whiskey is a. <clears throat> smooth. A geographic designated spirit by nature so <clears throat> when you say bourbon uh, what you're really saying is Kentucky whiskey mm. and <clears throat> criteria for being bourbon has to use Kentucky water be malted in Kentucky only has a maximum there's so many ingredients uh, same thing for scotch has to be malted in Scotland the Scottish water mm. uh, and you know, there's Tennessee whiskey like Jack Daniels and whatnot uh, there's Canadian whiskey um, you know, so every, every sort of geographical location will have its own, but there are a lot of things in common, like the limitation on the number of ingredients, the way that it's malted, the things that you can add. And also <clears throat> important designation for most whiskey is that, uh, it has to be at least 40% alcohol by volume, which means that it's 80 proof or higher. And so when you say that it has a similarity to like sneaking some of dad's bourbon as a kid, it's got the same very spirity uh, alcohol content. You definitely get the spirits right off the bat. So it's not really, it's not something you can just uh, kind of walk up to and just hit. You know, you really have to kind of mm -hmm. get a taste to it. Yeah, well, I'm diluting it a little bit, so it's good. Uh, an ice cube is good, and a few drops of water is also good. And that will release some of the spirits and the overtones and stuff, some of the the more complex smells and tastes. Cool, cool. So Dave, what's your favorite scotch? I'm still new to this. So, you know, uh, uh, I really like, this one I really love. This one is really great. Um, also tend to like a totally different style, Lefroy 10, which is, yeah, Petey and very, Burnt wood, shall we say, tasting. Hmm. Um, yeah, but kind of a taste. It's strong. It's like got a strong, very strong yeah. taste to it. But nothing subtle about Lafroy, for sure. But hey, uh, but you know, hey, there's there's those cocktails we had. Yeah, those were great. <laughs> and what about? Remember when we were in Vegas and we hit on the nickel slots and we got the uh, I think Macallan Twenty Four. Oh, yeah, I remember. But that was before I really started getting into it. I was like, you know, it's still, you got that. What was it? How much was that a, a glass? 
I don't know, 80 bucks for like one dram or something. Oh, right. Oh, that's wow. why. And I remember, <laughs> and then I remember <laughs> I made you buy me late. I, I bought that, right? And then, yes. and then, or I got it for you. And then um, I made you buy me a super high end tequila. Um, right. Do you remember what? What tequila was? No, I don't remember. <laughs> well, it did its job then. Yeah, exactly. Well, that whole trip was a little bit of a blur, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay, you know, here I got a question for everyone. Let's sure. let's start in okay. on a different subject here. Uh, George, why don't you tell us? Uh, how you started in all this? Uh, you know what? I'm not exactly sure I know. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, well, my mom could tell you because when I was a kid, <laughs> now I grew up, you know, not very well off. We were pretty poor. Uh, I actually went to school every day because I knew I'd, I'd eat, you know, lunch there. Um, but whenever I would get something, a toy or anything, I would take it apart. And so... <laughs> <laughs> this upset me greatly, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and so I, I start. I would get, you know, here's your Christmas present. Don't take it apart. <laughs> but it was hopeless. I just had to know how it worked, right? Right. Um, and so, and then, then in my early teens and stuff, I started getting into music, and um, I wanted to play guitar. Couldn't really afford to go out and buy gear, so uh, I took one a wood shop one year in high school. And, uh, you know, oh, I'm making a sign. Oh, don't worry, teacher. It's a sign. Yeah, I know it was a sign of a 412 cabinet. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait a minute. Why do you need a, a 32 inch square piece of plywood? Oh, it's a big sign. Don't worry. I get, why are you cutting four holes in it? Uh, you know, and then uh, so I built this 412 cab, and it was pretty hideous. And uh, then I, you know, I would write, I'd write a letter and request the carbon cabinet. Right. So I'm 14, 15, and the carbon catalog comes, and I look through it, you know, and study every page. I Then I got like 60 bucks together, and I ordered one carbon 12 inch speaker. I put it in my 412, right? It's like this shoddy 412 with four holes and one speaker. And, uh, you know, I, it started me down the path. And then um, later, I had some vocational school electronics and they covered nothing electronic or vacuum tube based whatsoever. Uh, this would have been the late eighties, early nineties. And it was all digital electronics. So I'm learning how to program EPROMs and stuff, but all I wanted to really do is know how to fix up an old amp so I could play loud guitar. And uh, so I did a couple of years of that. And then I, um, I befriended an old TV guy and when he was when he was retiring, he gave me a whole library of books, and I I started to try to read those and understand stuff. And it was it was a slow process, and then I'm going through boxes and boxes, and um, one box had this entire volume of the Navy Electronics course from the 50s. Oh, great! And so I. I picked up binder number one, you know, they were each this thick and there were 12 or 13 or a bunch of them. And so I started on binder number one, you know, this is an atom, this is an electron. And fully tried to work my way through that. And, uh, you know, I, if I'm being honest, I'm a slow learner and I have to go over things several times before they sink in. And so it took a long time. Uh, I started doing repairs, fixing amps, I restored a couple of things along the way. And uh, then I, I was playing music for a living. And so I spent a lot of time still, you know, couldn't really afford great gear or anything. I'm piecing things together, pedal boards on a two by four, you know, stuff like that. And it would always break. So now I'm on the road wherever and fixing stuff. And uh, I did that for a long time. And when I was, I don't know, I'd been on the road for a while. I had an old Marshall that I used to play. Let me pause for one moment. Cheers. Yeah. Uh, that's good. So I had a couple old Marshalls I used to drag around, a you know, main head and a backup. And so 
was planning a gig one night and or we're loading out and I can't find the backup head. And it, somebody walked off with it. And I, I was devastated because and I went back and looked at the head I played that night and it turns out that was my, my newer one. The one that was stolen was uh, a 1973 100 watt super lead. And it's uh, when I was 14, I cut grass all summer long. I saved up $400 and I bought this old super lead and it didn't work. Uh, I had all kinds of issues. I kind of was cobbling it together as I went and learning things and understanding stuff. And, it, you know, the recollection is that's why it was the backup head because I didn't know if it was reliable or not. So it was the backup head and it was the one I bought at 14 with all my summer savings from cutting grass. And after that, I was pretty devastated. And I said, I'm not taking this stuff, this gear that means something to me. I don't want to take it on the road. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me just, I'll take a, an Epiphone Les Paul and I'll upgrade the electronics and set it up nice. I'll play that. And first case scenario, I'm out. If that guitar is broken half or stolen or something, it's a five or $600 ordeal. It's not something that really I'm mostly invested in. Right. And I also thought, okay, well, surely there's something that sounds like that 73 Marshall. I'll just go get something new that's easily replaced and I'll play that and I'll be fine. And then I started playing everything I could and it didn't take long to realize, uh, you know, nothing really does sound like that old metal panel, super lead. And that was the mother of all invention for me as far as the catalyst to go, wait, why doesn't anything sound like that? And if I can't buy something that sounds like that old super lead, can I build something that sounds like it and take that on the road? And that was 20 years ago. And, and this is the turn when, when you should have gone, maybe I should just go back to school. I should have. <laughs> And I should have uh, done the double E route, whatever it takes. It would have saved me a lot of time because now I, I understand a lot about tube amps, but I'm not a double E. I'm not an electrical engineer. If I want to do something new, uh, you know, put a chip in something for switching or design a different kind of power supply or something, it's, I'm right back where I started. I'm back to the old books and I'm, I'm kind of learning things on a need to know basis yeah. and it's, it's made it, you know, just exponentially longer of a process than it really had to be. What, what I really meant was go back to school for something other than music related work. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I do. I can't stay interested in anything that long. Uh, well. Hey, by the way, we, uh, someone gave us a clarification. It was Johnny Bean gave us a clarification that Lucy's full name in the show was Lucille Elsmeralda Ricardo McGillicuddy. Oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, 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 now I remember. I would have never, well, it was Ms. Lucille McGillicuddy. That's all I would have known, not the uh, mm -hmm. Esmeralda Ricardo, blah, blah, blah. But um, there you go. So, awesome. And uh, yeah. some, yeah, he, he, leave it to Johnny. He would know that. And uh, someone else wrote, Landon wrote, uh, got Marshall? Uh, a little. Yeah. <laughs> So, so keep telling us, George. Keep telling us uh, how you got down this journey. Uh, well, that started in, uh, I was still playing music for a living. Um, but I was I definitely had grown tired of the lifestyle and the, uh, you know, I, I hit my early 30s and I have no home, no bank account. I've got, I'm driving crappy cars. Uh, and I'm kind of get to the point where you go, well, I've been a pro musician now for 12 years or something. And <laughs> I do have other aspirations kind of over this. I'd like to have kids someday. And I was, I was tired of it. And I'm thinking, well, what am I going to do? Really? Uh, what am I going to go get a factory job or something? And um, I started reading some stuff online. I, I discovered the internet, you know, and uh, realized that other people were in the amps too. And that uh, they, there were things that people who 
that were having the same experience as me needed, resources they needed, parts they needed. <clears throat> Guys who bought reissue Marshalls then said, this doesn't sound like an old Marshall at all. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I did that too. I agree. And so the first thing that I started doing was making a, a turret board just to drop in a reissue Marshall as a replacement that converts your reissue back to a more accurate vintage circuit and uh, upgrades all the, the components and the parts and the signal path hmm. and a few ways to tweak this or tweak this and just make it sound more vintage. And uh, I mean, I'm literally, I'm, I'm playing gigs and then coming home and running the drill press and making turret boards and stuff. And we got a, we got an online forum running and people are signing up and I'm like, I can't believe it. Somebody just bought one of these things and they, and they put it in their amp and it works and it, they like the sound. <laughs> so we were off and running. And then within a span of a few years, I'm selling DIY parts and the forums got a lot of traffic. We're discussing technical stuff and uh, eventually an entire amp kit. Um, so here you go. Here's everything with step-by-step -step instructions, build an amp kit that is a, a, a hundred watt super lead or a JTM 45 or whatever. Mm -hmm and ran with that did that for several years and was it called um where you were was it always metropolis or i, I seem to have in my memory uh metro it's... that was metro amp oh. yeah that was so just amalgamation of metropolis amplification mm -hmm. metroamp.com and uh, we, we had a great run eventually it got to the point we were selling tons of stuff and I was running around like mad. I didn't have the right organization. I didn't have the right people working for me. So it was just unsustainable. Mm. And I got to the point where I just, I couldn't do it anymore financially or physically. I, I ran myself right down and I had to, I had young kids by this time and stuff. And I had to make a hard choice to decide, okay, are you just a DIY amp kit guy for the duration or do you aspire to build your own amps, uh, you know, first replicas of the old stuff and then build, uh, you know, my own designs. And so I stopped only the amp kits in 2010. And now finally 2017, I've got some own designs out and stuff. Yeah. You were at NAM, right? Yeah. We showed at NAM for the first time a few months ago. That was an experience. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't get a chance to meet you then. Yeah, me too. It was it was a blur the whole week. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it, I haven't been feeling 100%. I've kind of been run down a little bit again. And so to go and do NAM, it was just exhausting. But uh, it was I heard it was successful and, um, you know, be, I, I, good re reaction to the stuff, right? I, I feel like we did better than I expected. Uh, the response was great. Uh, a lot of people coming up and saying, you know, good job. And a lot of kudos and... Uh, I was happy. That's cool. Yeah, right now. That's good. good. Yeah, I um, I, 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 I like walked right by it, and uh, you know what happened? Did you guys not have power at one point? We did. So on the first day, uh, okay, just an hour when the power went down, and so they come over and say, "Well, you must be using too many things, and you you've got a a, a fifteen amp drop," and they wanted to argue with me. Well, you're drawing too much current. I'm like. I have one amplifier on, and at idle, it draws less than one amp. <laughs> and it's been at idle all morning. It hasn't made a peep yet. And so uh, we had to arm wrestle a little bit, and then they finally turned it back on. Fine. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. And, and then the sound police came. Oh, how wow. many times? All of them. How many? <laughs> all of them. Every single one. Every yeah. Are they literally yeah. walking around with uh, little decibel meters? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, and some of them aren't very nice. The, the guy who knows nothing about, you know, a dB meter or whatever, he's instructed, okay, so this meter goes to here, and then you give him a warning. And So he comes. I'm standing there. I'm doing for somebody. I'm like, you can barely hear it over the percussion stuff just down the aisle. But he comes over, and he stands at the edge of the thing, and he said, taps me on the shoulder. You got to turn it down or I'm going to give you a warning. I'm like, turn what down? <laughs> and I'm playing 
and he's talking over it and I can hear everything clearly. Right. I'm like, I'm like, hold on. I can't hear you over the percussion section. So we turn away from that and he says, you got to turn it down. You get a warning. I'm like, well, okay. What's the limit? 90 dBs. Okay. I can clap my hands at 95 dBs. You know, and he's got the meter. I'm like, and so he's like 90 dBs, you know, he's hard line. I go, well, is that A weighted or C weighted? And he kind of, you know, <laughs> was a deer in headlights for a minute. And I'm like, well, if it's A weighted, it's an instantaneous peak, like those snare drums up there. If it's C weighted, then it's sound pressure level averaged over time. And there's a big difference. And how loud they get to be up the aisle is completely different from how loud I get to be, depending on what that is. And of course, he had no clue. I mean, there was no <laughs> deer in headlights, <laughs> just like boom. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. You lost him. You lost him. Yeah, I run through all of this, and he's like, "Just turn it." Down. <laughs> exactly. Okay, but see you next year. Oh God. So, what do they do if you if you don't, and they they, they end up giving you like a ticket or something? You have to pay a fine. I think they call it the I think they call it the Reinhold Wagner syndrome, don't they? That's a whole other story. <laughs> oh, yeah. they, they power we could get into a Reinhold Bogner stories here, but um, uh, give us give us one. Of the, I think oh, we got no, into no, one. Yeah, last? no, I, I got one. Hold on, but okay. uh, uh, what do they do? The warnings they give you. Uh, I think so, you get several written up warnings, and then if you go past that, they turn your power off. Done. Oh. You're finished. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That can really that. That's not good. That can really dampen your show, yes. So, so when we do Nashville, I'm sure we'll be uh, unfortunately uh, subjected to that. You know, Nashville is uh, much more laid back, but I don't know that they tolerate more volume. But the thing, the thing is, so, if you're friends with the sound guy and the the guy that's coming around, if he's a nice guy and you're you're you become sort of friends with him because you're there for so many days, mm -hmm. you know he'll just come up to you really nicely and just go, hey, could you turn it down a little bit? And if you comply and you always do that, then he's he's generally cool with it, unless you get just yeah. a jackass. Yeah, you get that. Which we, one time we had we had one of those guys, and we actually went to the supervisor and complained about him. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. An yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and and because we had some, I don't remember what year this was or something, but we we actually complained about him and uh, we we got him in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the little guy, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like uh, what happened on United. I mean, sometimes people take power a little too far, you know. Oh yeah, way, yeah, way over the line for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so now, now back to that Reinhold Bogner story yeah. that uh, you want. I seem to recall a uh, morning at an LA amp show once when uh, George uh, and his uh, uh, employee with, that was with him was. Uh, it was like already twelve noon. Show had been open two hours, and there's no one at his room. I mean, it's closed, shut up, locked. <laughs> this, this all. When his employee finally showed up, I go, what happened to you guys? And he was just shaking his head, and he goes, George said it would be okay to go out with Reinhold. <laughs> he goes, don't worry. It's okay. It's Reinhold. Yeah, no, it wasn't and, okay. And, and then proceeds to tell the story. In fact, you could tell the story better, but but I, I, do, I do believe uh, you. it was like 8 a.m. or some crap and you were at, at somewhere you didn't know where you were and was there not a midget involved oh yeah she punched me <laughs> yes <laughs> you could you could elaborate on this from there no no I, it never happened <laughs> we i mean you, you wind up somewhere in the the i don't know the bowels of la yeah, down some back alley with circus freaks and, you know, party lights and midgets and, oh, yeah, not good. You, you, you know, you ever party to the point where you're, you you get a moment of clarity and look around and go, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> yes. But remember, you you, <laughs> told, you, you said it'd be okay. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he doesn't work for me anymore. He quit. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. That was probably because of that. <laughs> How long ago was this? It was oh, a couple yeah. years ago or something. I don't know, four or five years ago. Was it that far? Maybe it was. Yeah. Before, I don't now, where were we? How about the other? Sorry, George. How about the other classic from the from the amp show that we pulled on you? Oh yes, there was a there was a great. Uh, so uh, so I'm sitting having breakfast uh, in the restaurant at the amp show with uh, I don't remember who at the time. Dina. And, was okay, maybe my wife was there. Could be. Yep. <laughs> and uh, my employee Travis comes running in. And goes, I don't know what's wrong. None of the amps will turn on. They're, now, they're, now I, you have to preface, it. To huh? preface it by saying that Travis woke up and got just completely stoned on his way to the show. <laughs> it walks in, his job to open up your room, and he walks in and nothing will turn on. Yeah. He's like, I don't, I don't know what happened. I, I don't know what happened. And what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and so, to put it just shortly, meanwhile, George is sitting at a table in breakfast, too, and I think he just started laughing. <laughs> and we're, we're, and we, we all look at George, and George had taken the fuses out of all the amps. <laughs> 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 Surprise! And, and uh, uh, No, did, wait, did Travis figure it out? And, uh, and, and Oh, he figured no. out there – no, he figured out there wasn't fuses because he said, who would do something like that? <laughs> His quote, his quote was, who would do something like that? Something? And that's when George started laughing. And I, we just look at him and we go, where are the fuses? It gets, <laughs> it gets even funnier because Dave is the guy who claims to be able to hear it sound different depending on the direction of the fuse. So not only did he have to put them back in, he had to try them at least two or three ways to decide which way was right. <laughs> Nice. That's a good yeah, prank. Yeah, right? Crazy. That's, now, well, that was a, I've, and I've never I've never gotten you back for that, so mm. no, it's coming someday. It's coming someday when you least expect it. <laughs> How do you know that that power situation at Nam wasn't Dave? <laughs> yeah, <it> was. <laughs> Sounds like you were buddy buddy with the the director there. There you go. Uh oh. Uh oh. Trouble. Trouble started. No. Um, I was gonna say uh, before, but then um, I got sidetracked. So let's have another drink. Cheers. All right. <laughs> Cheers. What are people saying on the blog here? Uh, that's that, it's great. Perfect. Perfect uh, segue here. So um, I'm gonna go back because we've got a lot of a lot of people here, a lot of talking, uh, and Molly is first again. Molly. Good for Just, you, but you know, hey, ask your questions in 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 the chat here. Anything you guys want to ask? Yep, within yep. within reason, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So we got we got a yeah. lot of great great guys here. A lot of the same same people. Um, and uh, uh, Keith Bears from the Good Guitar Gurus Network. Um, Tom Brino, uh, Adam O two two O seven. Let's see, Sinner, what's going on? Humbucker Lover, John Constantine, Bill Camporis. I'm looking for questions as I'm going down, by the way, so just so you guys know. Jaden James, uh, Greg Walker, uh, how are you guys doing, man? Thanks for joining us on a Friday night with George Metropolis. Can't, uh, really appreciate you guys. Really cool. Um, Michael James, Adam Scheinberg. Um, may, maybe what you could do, George, um, as I'm looking for a question here and going through it. Uh, Dave Nesdal and Johnny Dean, how you guys doing? Um, I, I'm curious what kind of amps you got behind you. So um, okay. maybe you can tell us something about some of that, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to search down here for uh, some questions. Okay. I, you know, old plexis really kind of tend to look all the same from the front. Uh, but if you're looking around the room, this is a, a block end 45, so JTM 45 with aluminum block ends. <clears throat> this is a 1967 Super Bass. Uh, so now it's steel chassis. Uh, this is kind of blocked by scotch here. This is my 12,000 series from 68. So uh, Van Halen's amp is number 12301. Mm. This is number 12380. 
right? Not far off. Yeah. No. So it's fairly close. Um, and yeah, it sounds incredible. That's my reference, super lead. If I have to have a super lead iconic tone, I go to that. Um, this stack is a 70s super lead. That's metal panel. Uh, it's like the one I this, just got. Uh, yeah, yeah, very much like that one. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and yeah. on the end is a, this is also 68 era, but it's super tremolo. And there's a, it's been worked on by a famous, like, reflective guy. You know, I'm not supposed to say anything. Um, and there's some more. There's a, there's a 50 watt out in the lobby. There's a, I have the block in 45 100 that, uh, that just got back from JD Simo. And, uh, that's the one that Eric Johnson had played and stuff. And let's see, let me unhook for a second here. This is where it all starts. 1959 basement. Hey, I played that. Yeah. Well, I was it, there when it was being played, one of the two. Yeah. And it it's amazing when you play it, you know, despite the the four tens and the open back, mm -hmm. you really when you when you play that amp, you really do get an idea of where this thing comes from. You know, you, you change the tubes and uh, the the type of output transformer and stuff, but the vibe is there. Is that an original one that you got there? That basement? Uh, yep, that's a real one. It's all original. Nice, real deal. Yeah, yeah, it's great. And so, Dave, when when you were here, that's when Dave Black was playing it, right? Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, and you play it, and you just go okay. And then we and those. then we played that that JTM forty five that you were restoring. Oh yeah, so the, that was earlier than this one. That wasn't blocking. It was earlier, and it was just to die for. Like you know, as far as sounding like old records and uh, just the swirling under your fingers when you're holding notes and stuff, mm. just unreal. Mm -hmm, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so that playing that 45 that you heard when you were here, this one had been in a box. And I picked up the, actually a friend picked it up as a basket case years ago. And then I was on a hunt. Uh, it didn't have any transformers. I searched, I waited, I watched, and finally an output transformer came up. And it was in Europe, and I, it wound up being a couple of thousand dollars US for the output transformer. Wow. And I didn't have the cash, but I, I tried, I found a way to come up with it and got the transformer. And then I was so like worried about if I did good or not, that I kind of put it on the shelf next to the rest of the parts and never got back to it. And after I played that 45, I, I was compelled. I had to put this one together. You had to have it. <laughs> I'm like, it yeah. It can't just sit here. So it actually has a, one of my reproduction power transformers. It has a uh, mid '60s choke that was rewound, and it has that original that expensive output transformer. Mm. And, you know, GEC KT66s, Mullard rectifier tube, Mullard preamp tubes, and uh, I, so I play it through this. Uh, this slant is uh, the speakers are all dated July of 1967. Nice. And so the lead stickered 25 watts or 25 watt stickered lead cones you know so they greenbacks originally up to that point were, were rated at 20 watts mm -hmm. marshall was selling two 412 cabs or 412 cab with 100 watts so they had to increase the rated you know wattage to 100 watts for the cabinet to go with the head and so they they put little 25 watt stickers over the 20 watt indication on the on the magnet covers. yeah <laughs> so it's the and it's, you know, when you play this together, it's like the creamiest, uh, like, you know, uh, I don't know, John Mayo, like, who's record. And so all of this happens mm -hmm. right in the midst of listening to the 45 100s and trying to work up with a circuit for the superplex. <clears throat> so the superplex is my 100 watt KT66 base amp. Uh, it's got a couple of different you know, levels of gain and a built-in boost and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I got really, really close to the 45100s, and I'm really geeking out, tweaking things. And I'm getting close enough you, you can switch back and forth from old, the original amp and the Superplex and not really hear a difference. And 
I'm like going, okay, I'm happy. This is, this is right on. It's good. And then I put this thing together <laughs> and I started comparing this to the superplex and this to the 45 100s and stuff. And I went, Oh no. <laughs> and yeah. You opened up a can of worms, didn't you? I'm under all this pressure, you know, financially, we're just barely getting by and I'm supposed to be shipping the superplex and people are waiting and Nam has come and gone. And I'm, and knowing myself the way I do, I knew I, I was going to, it was going to take me longer because I wasn't, once I had this as a reference, it, it wasn't good enough any longer. And so back to the drawing board. And so now I'm down the rabbit hole again and I'm questioning everything in the circuit from the input jack to the output jack and try different types of capacitors and uh, you name it. And then then another sort of epiphany or sort of planetary alignment thing happened. And that was this. Then this thing entered my life. The audio precision analyzer. Thank you very much. <laughs> so this is the APX 515. This is an audio analyzer. It's made by audio precision. And what it does is measure virtually everything you can think of audio. And so <clears throat> this shows up. I start to get my feet wet with it. And next thing you know, I'm running frequency sweeps of the amp, frequency sweeps of cabinets. I'm, I'm probing into different parts of the circuit and you can actually put on headphones and listen to different parts of the circuit. You can, you can run sequences where it shows you how the amp responds at different levels, how it clips at different levels. And you can literally take a full sort of DNA sample of everything that this amp does. And so now I'm like, I'm off the geek charts. It's just over, right? And so I've got the 45, I've got this analyzer here on a demo, you know, so I'm like, they could ask for it back at any time. So I'm, I'm not sleeping at night. I'm trying to use every available minute to use this thing and get it as much data as I can. And fortunately so far, so I use all that. It finally comes together. Superflex is good now. Uh, we had it on display last weekend at the, the LA guitar show. And we had Owen Barry there playing it and stuff. And so now I just want to sleep a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready for a nap. And, <laughs> uh, and, and the, uh, so the analyzer thing, there's still, I've only scratched the surface. And be, by the time I'm done, I'll own one of these things. And every amp in this place, every cabinet, every speaker will have the, you know, we'll acquire all the data we can from it. And we'll have a, just an archive of why does this amp sound like it does? Why does that amp sound like it does? You know, it, it just just cracking the code, so to speak, on this stuff. That's awesome. Very cool. It's overwhelming. Like I, I have to talk myself off the cliff once in a while. I'll be like, okay, just you know what, go to sleep. Breathe. It'll be there tomorrow, <laughs> right. <laughs> That's cool. Hey, we've got a question from Bill Camporis. He wants to know, a pretty straightforward question. He wants to know, is it all transformers? I guess because you were talking about getting the transformers, you know, like maybe from a tone perspective, is it all the transformers that's there? It's, it's not. Each transformer contributes in its own way. And uh, the output transformer will have a lot to do with it because everything in the circuit has to go through the output transformer to interact with the speakers. So it does have a lot of influence but the, uh, the behavior of the power supply is going to be the power transformer and the filtering and stuff working together. And a one power transformer might not sag at all. It might be very stout and just have a lot of punch where another lower rated power transformer might, when you play hard, the power supply sags and you get that compression thing going on. And so it, that contributes too. And not only not only that, but uh, you know everything else too. Uh, every, every brand of resistor, kind of capacitor, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the pots. Oh my God, uh, it's boy, talk about a rabbit hole. Oh yeah, I mean, and Dave and I were talking about this, and he's like, "Well, how consistent are your Metroplex now?" And we're comparing notes to like the brown eye and stuff. And honestly, most of the components are within one percent all the time 
tubes are a huge variable, but with the Metroplex specifically, it's down to the taper of the treble pot. And if uh, if you've got a 250K treble pot and you put it right up the middle and it's linear, it should be 125K with it set right at noon. But you install, you know, you buy 100 of these pots and some of them at noon might be 95K. Some of them might be 140K and, and anywhere in between. And if you consider sweeping your volume knob from say 10 o'clock to two o'clock, and that that's going to be the pre built in taper of that. Mm -hmm. You can understand how amps could vary, you know, from one another just on that alone. Yeah. That's, that's good that you just said that. Cause that, there was a question there about, about pots as well. There's another, there's another question I saw on here about uh, what tubes do we like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> none. Uh, I, I, I th yeah, exactly. None. <laughs> <laughs> Old ones. <laughs> What what yeah. don't we ha what tubes do we not hate the most? Um, well, for me, wow, EL thirty fours are rough. It's rough. Um, I mean, for for what I use, I either use JJ's or or TAD, which is a, a Chinese uh, tested uh, tube. Um, the 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 JJ's might be a little more robust, but maybe the TADs sound a little tiny bit better. Um, uh, but other than that, for power tubes, I wish all my amps could be 5881 power tubes like in the Dirty Shirley because, because those tubes just don't go down ever. Hmm. I mean, they just always work. I mean, it's so few tubes that I have to replace on that amp. Uh, rectifier tubes, that's a different story, but, um, and what, what brand he, are the 5881s? What, what was that? Sorry, you cut out for a minute. Oh, sorry. What brand are the 5881s? Sovtech. Oh, okay. Yeah. Nothing, nothing real special. It's just, uh, it's just a very durable, robust tube. You know, it, it works yeah. really well. Um, what, is it the best sounding? Probably not. But uh, did I sort of voice that amp around that tube? Yes, I did. So uh, it kind it works. Um, you, you have no choice. You you really need to find a tube that's robust and commit to it and design around it and hope that it doesn't change too much from batch to batch because you just can't you can't expect any modern production tubes to behave like old tubes. Uh, so in like in the Metroplex and Superplex. I'm actually doing some frequency notches where I compared old tubes to new tubes and found that a new tube tends to have a, a harshness and a certain very narrow frequency band. And so let's use a modern tube. Let's just notch that out. And then you actually get surprisingly close. Yeah. But then there's reliability. <laughs> well, you know, and, and we're, we're opposite ends of the spectrum, Dave and I, because I might use, you know, uh, four sets of tubes a week. And you might use, what, 40 on some weeks? And um, so... Yeah, more, probably. Yeah. I, and even with the, the scale, the, the inconsistencies and the headaches with tubes remain on both ends i mean there's no it, yeah what exactly but what what you see what you really see um with large production which we're doing a reasonably large production at this point uh is you really see the faults then because you know you you have thousands of amps out in the field and mm -hmm. you know well you can just see the trend you go wow these tubes are all failing awesome great what do I use now? No, so there's really not any choices. And you get like a whole batch and you see a pattern then a run where they, Oh yeah. Pattern. The whole, the whole batch. Yeah. That's why I say I use either EL 34. Cause right now we use either yeah. depending on what's being behaving itself more. And, and do you, if, if you're using the, the JJ instead of the Chinese, are you changing anything in the circuit? Not or? really. I, not, not at this point. You can't really, I mean, there's a good chance maybe the the end user is going to change the tubes anyway. That maybe they want to use, um, um, you know, Svetlana, yeah. Sovtex Svetlana, or maybe they want to use an EH EL34, or 
Maybe they want to put KT sixty sixes in the amp. I don't know. You know. Uh, you know, but but no, I I don't I don't go changing because actually, you know, to be honest, that those two tubes that I mentioned actually sound similar um, oh. overall. No, uh, I, I think I think the TAD ones or the Ruby branded versions. Uh, well, actually, the TAD ones sound a little bit better for some reason, but um, they tend to sound maybe just a, t a tad more open sounding and a tad less compressed than the JJ that, JJ uh, power tubes. On the JJs, is it the EL thirty four or the E thirty four L? Well, mm. it's really the same tube. <laughs> So, I thought there was a different plate structure. There, no, thought. there's not actually a difference in the construction at all. Um, uh, it's oh. it's there's a, a rating that the factory does, and if it falls, if it come goes above the rating, it's an E34L. If it goes below the rating, it's an EL34. Oh, right. It is I, the same tube I, actually. I the, the E34L had a slightly higher like plate plate dissipation rating or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's basically the the okay. the, the deal. Um, they sound basically the same. I mean, to be honest, where I get where you know I get the tubes from ARS Electronics and Marty for the for those at least, and um, and for all you know, for all I know, some of them are E34Ls and some of them are EL34s. He brands them all EL34s. Hmm. So uh, right. I, I mean, they're they're all good. They've been really consistent lately. Again. Knock on wood. Yeah, I mean, right, right. Now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, hey, we've got a question. Sorry, Dave, go ahead. Uh, it, let's just touch on one more thing. Preamp mm -hmm. tubes. Um, <coughs> Preamp tubes, that's a whole other story, too. Pretty much everything. Uh, the Chinese tube is the most consistent and works in every slot, but mm -hmm. can't, doesn't work for microphonics. Uh, generally speaking, you can get some. But, uh, you know, people wonder why I use JJ's in the first two slots of my amp. And it, it's just, frankly, it's not because I love them. It's because they'll work. Mm. Um, if I had, a, you know, my choice, I'd, I'd, I'd try, try to use another uh, Chinese 12AX7 that's low microphonics, like a Ruby HG Plus or something. Right. But the, the fact of the matter is, it, it, when you're making thousands of amps you just can't get enough ones that you can use in the first slot it just doesn't happen I, you know I, it just I you can't it, you know if i build four or maybe five amps in a week i have the same issue finding tubes to go in v1 hmm. yeah so imagine that times you know a hundred or something <laughs> I, I can't i can't even imagine the headache on that scale yeah so and that in that turn i use jj's because why they work now, they work and they're they, not they, microphonic. Yes, they're they're very non-microphonic in the first okay. slots. Uh, uh, you know, I like uh, Tung Sol Two better uh, in the first slots, or or the Chinese two different sounds. Mm -hmm. Solotech WB is not horrible in the first slots, um, but other than that, I mean, I, you don't really have a lot of choices again. Yeah, you know, oh, basically uh, three choices now. Yeah. yeah. And are you still using, what are you using now? Are you using the Muller one still? So, uh, yeah, I'm using the CV4004. Mm -hmm. And that's a, there is a military tube, an old stock military yeah. tube called the CV4004. And that was a, an equivalent of a 12AX7. Now, uh, new sensor is building that under the Muller you know, right. brand. It's really not the same plate or structure or anything no. as, a no, of course not. as an old one. But it is a short plate structure, and it uh, it has good gain, and it tends to be less microphonic. And hmm. uh, it, I, I don't, I haven't had an issue with hum because we're using DC for the heaters right. on those pre. -tubes. That helps. It kind of eliminates one variable that you might have to reject a preamp tube for. But short plate in general, smaller structure, less microphonic. Mm -hmm. And and when you get good ones, they they do sound pretty good. So. When I was at NAM, there was um, a company that walked up to me and gave me their card uh, about new production tubes. Did you see this company? I think it was, I, I don't, I, I can't remember the, something, Ganyax or something like that. They were actually making new production tubes. 
Did you guys hear about this? No. The one I know of was uh, it was sort of seeded by Korg, and it was a it was a micro tube built into sort of like an IC package. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just starting to find its way into some production. Um, let me. I have something that's an oddity. Talk amongst yourself. I'll be right back. Talk about myself. Oh shit! I think we should just drink again. <laughs> 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 I got to talk about myself. Well, what, what other questions we have in here? Maybe we can we can go to some of that. Yeah, we did have a good question. Um, okay, so here uh, we go. Oh, never mind. Here we go. Back. All right, we're back. That was fast. Cool. Uh, a few years ago, there was a company that bought some old Philips uh, tech tube. Oh, this yeah. Blackburn. Yes, I remember this thing. Yeah. Okay, so they're in Blackburn. They've got old Philips uh, tooling and stuff, and they made just some of these. Uh, I had a couple of them. They didn't last very long. It's got really kind of an odd plate structure. Um, I don't know exactly what they were copying, and I don't know how much of this you can see. Mm. But it actually it was a new design, like, supposedly. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was supposed to emulate sort of the game characteristics of a dual triode, you know, like an AX7. Uh, but I, I don't know if they just didn't have the funding or what. But they they went belly up. Yeah, it didn't last. So I'm. Yeah, I'm no. This this is kind of like a, a conversation piece now. Well, the, I remember. I, I remember I that. one of those. Go ahead, Dave. Somewhere, I got one of those somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think I remember. I remember that company. They were posting all over the gear page many years ago. Yeah, right. And there was a lot of hype around. Yeah, it. yeah they they were like making them out of the old Blackburn factory. That's mm -hmm. what it was. And yeah. It seems to me that the consensus, uh, not only funding, but. Uh, this is when you started to hear that a lot of the sort of the, the magic formulas and stuff had died with the old craftsmen who knew how to really formulate the tubes and stuff. And that a lot of the, uh, the technique and the art of it was lost to history now. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking up this, uh, this, this company. I can't, I can't find it. Um, I, I'll have to look it up, but they walked up to me and is this, are you thinking of the company that does a, a tube package with the pins, but it's actually transistor and discrete circuits inside a tube shape package? So it's a solid state tube replacement. No, actually, they were they were talking about. I, I'd have to go look for it. Quite honestly, oh, yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, you, you, if you guys want to, you guys talk amongst yourselves. Let me go <laughs> find it. Let me, I'll be I right mean, back. All right. I have. Back. Yeah, I, I have. I have no. I have no hope. Uh, with uh, a company making new tubes now. I, I don't think it's possible. Well, you, uh, you know how to make a small fortune in the tube business? Yeah. Start with a big one. <laughs> How's your scotch treating you, Dave? The scotch is great. Uh, what else we got here? I, I can I can field a couple questions. Uh, you know what? I'm not looking at the whole thing, but uh, Tom Platts, how often should I... Uh, EL34 power tubes to be replaced uh, after how many hours of use? I, I have an answer for that, uh, uh, Tom. Um, it's if they're working, don't change it. Because just because they're new tubes doesn't mean they're going to work. <laughs> I mean, if they're working and it still sounds okay to you, leave them alone. Yeah. That means they're hardy and they're still going to work. When – when modern production tubes start to give up, they just it, it, your tone gets kind of weak. You start to lose some low end punch, and it's a matter of time. You know they've started their yeah job yeah at that point. And if you gig regularly, <clears throat> if you're touring, you're playing every week, just plan on once a year change your output yeah. tubes. Hmm. But if you're not, I mean, you know, you can go a lot longer. Absolutely, you know, $10. and 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 you know the funny thing is, I remember my old fifty watt plexi that I have. Uh, uh, I had that, I don't know, from the early nineties. Right. And <laughs> I didn't change the tubes in it till, oh, I don't know, maybe 2002. <laughs> so, uh, although I think I got your beat on that. Th they were, they were, they were old, old, vi you know, vintage tubes. So, right. Uh, you know, it basically until it gave up the ghost, they didn't get changed. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't blame you. Because uh, they were old. What were they? I think were they old? It might have been vintage. Oh, 
vintage RFTs or or Tesla maybe of some sort. Can't quite. No, it wasn't Tesla. I think it was old RFTs. Hmm. Nice. And uh, it lasted forever. <laughs> Sounded great right till it started to fluctuate in volume a bit. <laughs> I've got a uh, original fifty one fifty combo PV fifty one fifty combo um, fifty watt that still has the original tubes in it. I think it's from the 90s, yeah. late nineties. It's still working. The reason that still works is they only bias the tubes to like fifteen milliamps. <laughs> oh, is that right? They bias it so cold. <laughs> That those tubes will last forever; they'll never burn up. <laughs> so that I mean, I, should I should I rebias this thing? Uh, it great it greatly improves if it, if you can. Yeah, well, that, that I mean, that original amp probably didn't have a bias pot, but it can be biased. It, right. Yeah. You just have to adjust a resistor, or put hmm. a pot in one of the two. Uh, but gotcha. uh, yeah, you know, the funny thing is, I think someone also asked about a, a fifty one fifty three amp, a fifty watt, and is there better tubes I can use? You know, when I when I was working um, with uh, Eddie Van Halen, um, we went through. We did this little kind of shoot tube shootout with his with his amps, and he you know wanted to know what hey what's the best tube for this amp? So we, you know we tried everything, um, and in the end, at the time at least, I think it might have changed since then. But at the time, honestly, in that amp, the best sounding. Uh, 6L6s were the JJ 6L6s, actually. That's what came shipped and, in line. And, and the preamp tubes also, across the board, we used JJs because we tried everything else and just it had the most – it worked the best in that particular amplifier. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't recommend that almost for anything else, but it worked really well in that amplifier. And the funny thing, you think, is it also worked uh, – in the uh, I used to with Steve Stevens when he had um, uh, the PV ones, I used to retube those with JJ's also, and it worked great in that amp. It's funny, same same amp, just later revision with a different company. But uh, for some reason, those tubes just seem to work well with those amps, so I just left it alone. You know. Interesting. That's. Did you work on that with with Ed on the uh, the original the the Fender fifty one fifty that they ended up coming out with? Is yeah, that this the one that's the one I was talking about. Basically, after they had already come up with it originally, they had some Sovtech tubes in it, some different things, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we did a little tube shootout because he wanted to know what uh, Matt Brock, myself, and uh, did it together first, and then we presented it to him. Um, but yeah, so that's why the JJs were decided on at the time, which which Fender shipped with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, that's what I came, mine came with. I bought I the original. Might, I think he might have changed uh, to a different 6L6 um, in recent times, but it, I don't think it's available anymore. So I think he changed to a Svetlana for a little while, mm -hmm. but it's not yeah. available anymore. So, By the way, this is the company that uh, contacted me. Uh, it was called Gainiacs. And it basically says they design and manufacture modern high-end vacuum tubes for musical application. We use modern manufacturing techniques to build new tubes to cherish specs in the USA. Our pro proprietary process allows us for tighter tolerances and better reliability of competitive prices. 12 AX7s and, AX and EL34s available uh, in Q3 2017. That's what they say. Wow. Really? That's what it says. I don't know. Uh, they were pretty excited. What's that, George? I'll keep my eyes peeled. I'm, that piques my interest. Yeah, because I, I remember when that Blackburn company was, or those guys were posting all over the gear page, and everybody was like, oh, my God, send me some tubes. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they, yeah. they have a website. Oh, they do? Ganiac does? Uh, not much of one. In fact, almost none of one. One page. Uh, one very brief page. Okay. Saying basically exactly the same thing that you just said. So yeah. All right. well, more to uh, come, we'll see. We'll see. It's it's a it's a hard it's a hard thing to do. Uh, in the US. I don't think, hmm, good luck with uh, you know, OSHA and uh, all the regulations, the EPA and all the regulations in the US. Good luck. Well they are rolling uh, back all the EPA 
regulations actually yeah, that could change. I'm well sorry. that's a whole other story right <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to go down that no path. we won't but uh just just saying it's time for another drink how about that yeah no we're not we're not going down that path that's that's uh that opens up a can of worms boy yeah um, no doubt. No doubt. let's go down this path let's, let's dive into dave's most favorite land are you ready uh-oh eddie van halen you you open the door. You what did. about it? How do you get the brown sound? Oh geez. <laughs> First of all, hand transplant <laughs> might be in order. You know, the hand transplant might be the way to do that. Uh, I, oh, okay, let's throw it down. Twelve series super lead specs. Okay. Wow. Well, uh, it's it's a stock plexi Marshall man <laughs> with a variac with six eight seven tubes in it. What about the, the three three in the V two? Huh? The what? What about the three thirty mic cap on V two? Is that there or not? Yeah, okay, that's a three thirty mic cap in V two. It's going to add a little more. Uh, you know, I don't know if, how critical necessarily that is. Um, I mean, there were a lot of you know. Uh, it, it comes down, you know what, if you have a great old Marshall that is particularly aggressive um, from any year, the one I just got from 1970, right, with mm -hmm. fire filtering and everything, man, it, talk about gain. I mean, Pete Thorne came in and plugged into that amp, and he was like, oh, yeah, I really need a pedal or boost with this. Not, <laughs> you know, it was, it was just like raging, you know, like all the harmonics and the, everything. And he was playing all the, the Van Halen riffs and, and stuff. And you're like going, okay, that's without really the tubes. That's without the Variac. That's without anything. And there it is, you know. So, um, but I, not everyone can play that kind of stuff with the aggression yeah. and the fire in their hands. Um, I've heard people that I've heard people like Pete play through that amp, right? But then another person can come in, plug into that same amp and you're sitting there looking at it going, did it break? <laughs> I'm not joking. Did it break? I mean, like there's something wrong with it. I mean, I, I, this has happened several times because this other person, his hands don't have any seemingly gain to their hands, meaning there's seems like there's no sustain. There seems like there's no gain whatsoever, mm -hmm. and the, the notes are they're just tripping over themselves with it. Yeah. And 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 I've run into that time and time again with players over the years. You know, it's just everyone has a different set of hands and they sound different. And now, the rule is, if you come to my shop, you have to come in here and play a vintage Marshall stack. And Scare the living shit out of people. What, yes. <laughs> every single who plays it, that I plug them in, turn it up, and without fail, they go, grunt, grunt, and then stop. And you see, like, processing, gears turning, and the light bulb going off. They go, oh, okay, I get it now. And some of them, you know, you know, a plexi can be very humbling and it can definitely separate the men and the boys as far as that playing style. So yeah. If you, if you dig in and you hit a note like you mean it mm -hmm. and you really wring everything you can out of it, it will re it'll reward you big time, you know, like the angels sing and stuff. But if you try to pussyfoot around and – just be non-committed and you know just just hack your way or half-ass your way through some stuff it's the most revealing thing you ever want to do as a player it's just <laughs> you've got to commit and you've got to dig in and mean it or else you'll just be exposed oh yeah you'll, you'll it sound like yeah like a lead brick hitting the ground <laughs> <laughs> so it really is just very revealing in terms of uh any mistakes it does it does it's not covering up anything no, not at all. There's there's nothing to hide behind. Yeah. Yeah, it's not that like yeah. level of gain that's just like hiding your your imperfections, which some not people 
do like throw on a bunch of gain and a bunch of delay and hear me roar but no this is like you throw that on and you got to know how to play yeah got to work for it that that's separates cool. yeah that separates the men from the boys and then a plexi boy yeah that's uh that's not for the faint of heart you know no, I, same I, same with a high watt oh god a high oh, watt's high even watts. more a high watt's even more brutal more, yeah would you call would you um, consider a high watt like very sterile? It's just you know like I hate the word, but it just where it, you know it, the, it there's something about the character where you I mean you really you know when you hit it you ev you're gonna hear every imperfection potentially. Uh, I don't know. Would have I, you played one? I I have, but only I, let me rephrase that. I played a reissue, not on on an old one. Okay. Uh, first of all. Uh, you got to play an old one, one of these days for sure. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, it's got to be pretty close to on ten, uh, oh, okay. which which is going to hurt you. Um, uh, uh, personally, a fifty watt high watt I like the best. Um, it's a little less brutal, but not much. Um, uh, but the fifty watt ones, they're kind of special. I think they're, they're they have a they have a sound, and you just you just kind of want to hit a couple who chords. On them, mm -hmm. and and when you do that and feel the percussion, the, the, the percussive feeling mm -hmm. of the guitar and the amp hitting you in the chest, you're just like, Oh man, that's cool! <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, that's cool. I'm deaf now, but it's cool. So, um, and the, the who chords are mandatory. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Even you know, even when yeah even when I tried uh, Stevie Fryatt's uh, Sound City amps, you know, yeah, right. which are very very much uh, the from what I understand the 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 early Sound City amps were basically uh, the high watt design or very similar the very yeah. first ones before mm -hmm. they went off to different lands, uh, but Dave Reeves did, and uh, even when Stevie's made these new Sound City amps. And uh, several several amp shows we we've gone in and like the, I think the last amp show I, I attended I wasn't exhibiting but I attended and he was there and I, I go he goes you want to try the hundred watt I got the hundred watt up and running I'd already tried the fifty <laughs> I go yeah I want to try the hundred watt and like you know there was there was power attenuator on it and this and that and I go let's turn all this stuff off you know <laughs> turn all the power attenuator up and let's turn it up and so like the master went all the way up and the the, the volume went close to all the way up, or at least like an eight, and uh, and and <laughs> he gave me his uh, Hamer guitar uh, that he has, like the Junior Hamer with two humbuckers. He has that sounds really good, his guitar, and uh, and because he knew what I was going to do with it. First thing I do is a couple of who chords, and <laughs> he's just like smiling from ear to ear because we had the head going with two <laughs> cabinets. <laughs> On ten in the hotel room of oh, wow. of, of the amp show. <laughs> this is the LA amp show. Yeah, the LA amp show, and I and I'm like going, yes, <laughs> <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> so, what speakers is is he using in the Sound City cabs? Is, the Fanes. Is that new Fane? Yeah, that new Fane, the the so, F seventy, I do believe. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's it. Yeah. It's got so it's kind of cream in color. It sounds amazing. Yeah, you said it was great. Yeah. Now my take on a high watt is uh, it, you have to get philosophical about amps for a second because <clears throat> for me to explain it, I have to go to this. When you have a player who has the touch where they can play hard and things are distorted, to play light and things are chimey, mm -hmm. and you have that touch, and then you combine that with a great instrument into an amp especially a non-master volume amp that breaks up at a certain level and then play that into a speaker that the ratings of the speakers are such that about the time where the guy digs in hard, the amp starts to break up and the speaker starts to round things off and break up. And everything is right on this edge where play hard, everything really starts to grind, play light, everything opens up and gets chimey. And you have a synergy happening between the player and the instrument and the amplifier mm -hmm. and something really special happens in that scenario. And with a high watt and with the, the old solid cabs loaded with fanes, that special thing 
for me, it just happens at a much louder volume level. <laughs> so still there, it's just brutally loud where you get that that interaction thing happening. You know, can you attenuate it? <laughs> well, yeah, you, but you can, but you lose some of that dynamic. The high end. Uh, the, well, the dynamic of the speakers mm -hmm. the yeah. when they're idling and they're and they're being pummeled by the amp. Yeah, the they're yeah, they're amp yeah running clean and and starting to overdrive and clipping hard and. When, when all of those things are in like a an alignment and that that special thing's happening, it's a pretty amazing experience. And when you attenuate, you're just kind of taking one part of that recipe away. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, there a particular? It, sorry, Dave. It, go ahead. it doesn't. It doesn't. Um, when the speakers are begging for mercy, and 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 you're feeling the percussion. I think we lost George. Uh, George, you still there? My battery was dying. It's coming back. Okay. Uh, the and the feeling of the percussive, you know, nature of uh, of the amp. Yeah, when you attenuate it, you lose all that. You just kind of lose it. It just like even no matter how good the attenuator is, it's still the amp sounds good still, but it mm -hmm. it it you know something's lost without the 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 volume. Is so there a wanna, I, we got to make some T-shirts and you know, like now trending volume or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> because you know that's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that's lost uh, these days with the you know advent of you know like modeling and different things. Mm -hmm. There, there's an interaction and an, uh, the angst and the 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 rock and rollness, so to speak, of a loud amp um, that. Um, Man, you, you you just you just kind of you, you got to have a speaker on the stage, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to be rebellious with a modeler. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, and, yeah, and, and you know, just like you know, the, I mean, they serve a purpose, you know, um, which is fine. But you know, they don't. You know, you look at George's cabinets behind him there, and you just go, "Oh, that's cool." Yeah, what are those things screaming? But maybe that's lost on a 15-year-old. I don't know, you know, or 16-year-old now. You know, I'm not sure. I don't know. It, young people and old people alike come in and play an old sack and just kind of rearranges their chromosomes. <laughs> I, think, I think it's undeniable. Literally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Might, might neuter you also. <laughs> I think it does. <laughs> so, George. Or he was he just. A phone charger. Hold on. Okay. Sorry, let me, let me check. Yeah. His phone. He just wants to make sure his phone doesn't die there. Yeah. I, sparks came out of the charger, so I think that's probably not good. <laughs> oh, that's, not, that's not a good thing. Don't kill your phone. I'm just checking the chat. We've got a we got about 60 people watching right now. Yeah, well, I think we have some questions definitely in here that we maybe need to go through. All right. Uh, I am charging again, so I'm good. We can go all night. Okay, Brent Brent Harmon says, "What is your favorite Marshall amp to play?" Uh, well, for me lately, it's this this JTM forty five. I mean, that's really kind of uh, I'm having a honeymoon with this thing. Cool. Okay, and then someone asks uh, Scott MacArthur wants to know, uh, Dave and George, what do you think of Fred Tacone's amps from D Divided by Thirteen? He says he's a big fan of all this stuff. Yeah, most definitely. That is great stuff. Yeah, Fred. Fred's a cool guy. And it's not just, uh, you know, oh, let's take this and put this with this, and you know, slap them together, and it is what it is. That's, to me, it's really refined. It really, they have a very distinct voicing, and they're really thought out, you know, all the way through. That's cool. Um, so going back to one one question I actually had was about the attenuator. Is there any particular attenuator that you guys recommend? I see you have a THD, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have it, and I have I have kind of a hate hate relationship with it. <laughs> uh, I I have to use something because I don't want to damage those old, you know, twenty watt greenbacks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've got a I do have a power break up there, and I've had those for years. And, uh, you know, really, that those attenuators that that Dave was uh, had a couple prototypes knocking around is probably the best one I've heard. And then 
you, when you evolve past that and you look at the power station, it's kind of like, okay, well, where I don't know where you can go from there. I don't, do you have anything? Yeah. Better? No, I mean, you know, the thing is the reason, the reason that, uh, you know, we had a attenuator prototypes and the reason I have chosen not to make them is because one, it was very costly to make. It would have to be a, a, a bit high dollar figure to do it. Hmm. And frankly, I mean, Stevie Fryette's come out with the power station, and that is a great product. So my choice for a power, power attenuator, which it really is an attenuator. It's really a, a load device and a tube power amp in one. Yeah. But, but um, it's super transparent, and, man, it, it, you know, you're, it allows you – with doing that, it allows you to have an effects loop between your, your non-master volume amp and, and, and your cabinet, you know. Hmm. And uh, hell, you can use that thing to it, as a power amp. You can use it for a variety of uh, things. Uh, it's it's a great um, it's a great product. So um, so for an attenuator, uh, you know, go buy Stevie's. It's fantastic. It's a, it's a great product. So uh, you know, he's been a longtime friend. I hope uh, I haven't talked to him about it yet, but I hope to have him on the show at some point too. Yeah, mandatory. That's yeah, it'd cool. be great. What about yeah. that? Uh, SPL just put out a new one. Have you tried that? No, no idea. Okay. I'd like to listen to that. No sometime. idea. There was, um, I bought the hose attenuator. You remember that? Not Which sure. one? N hose attenuator. The guy's name, it was Ho. Or, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. The guy that, the well, ultimate, that was, the, it was the, the ultimate, ultimate attenuator. attenuator. Yeah. Ultimate, yeah. Yeah. The, but Ho was the original designer. Yes. Um, yeah. And his were actually a little bit better sounding, and um, but yeah, uh, same, it was very good. similar similar idea, similar idea though, um, with a load and, and a sort of a reamping kind of right mm -hmm. kind of kind of deal. Um, I, I've got one of those also, and it was it was like everything else where I can only go so far. I can go a couple of clicks. Mm -hmm. or what it does to the tone and dynamics it you know becomes diminishing returns if I then you have to start messing around with the dials and on the and amp then, yeah i might as well just be using something else yeah different, different tool different amp you know what's funny funny not bad for a few clicks down is like an air brake the old train wreck design uh oh, yeah. you know if you're, if you're just knocking a few db off it, it worked really well there's yeah. been Produced by several people since, but yeah, and, and the uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Alex thing that became a scumbag thing. Yeah, that was good too. Yeah, same story. You a couple of clicks, two or three clicks, yeah. fine. Yeah. So uh, Keith Barris from the Guitar Guru Network says the Power Station Two is tremendous. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, he says he's selling the Power Station Two like crazy. Oh wow. See now, is that only for a non-master volume amp? That's what we're talking you, about right here. You can no, you can use it for anything. Right. It doesn't it doesn't matter, but okay. I mean, it's just a question of if it if it is going to really make a, a a huge benefit for you to use your master volume amp into into the the attenuator. Um, I I you know you're not on most master volume amps. You're not deriving most of the tone from the power section. Um. Because you're not driving the power section like you are in a non-master volume amp. Mm -hmm. So, um, like when people ask that, should I use an attenuator of my Friedman amp? I, I, I'm kind of like, yeah, not really. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's not going to be that much difference. And most people that have tried it, are like, yeah, it wasn't that much different. Um, yeah. So, um, ideally, I see an attenuator as being able to take, you know, take your non-master volume amp and and making it you know it cranking it diving it and you know making it sound you know like distorted and great you know but uh, you get to the point and then you set your rhythm tone and you want it to have a boost to play some leads and you've got nowhere to go everything is clamped at that mm -hmm. level well you can do it with the fry app. and that's why you wind up with the second setting and the foot switch yeah you have yeah. to i mean it's you can do that with a fry amp. You can even put a boost pedal in the loop of the fry amp to give you a bump. Oh, uh, nice. Or, or the other thing about the fry amp power uh, power station is, you know, you can take a five watt amp and make it a fifty watt amp, or forty watt, or whatever. So you can take your champ 
and make it a loud amp, you know, you know, and like, so I think that's also a really cool thing. You know, if you got huh. some little crappy little cr crappy little old silver tone amp or, or, or something that you really like and you like how it distorts and stuff, but it's not loud enough mm -hmm. well, you can make it loud enough now. Interesting. But, but, but it's not miking it. It's somehow. No, no, because it loads down the amplifier and then it's putting it into a 50 watt tube power amp or a 40 watt tube power. Ah, I see. That's super cool. So that's then cool. it it it's giving you you know you can it basically that's the power it is. Yeah, it's very cool. Gotcha. Hey, we got a question from Mully. He wants to know, and I don't I've not heard of these amps before. What do you guys think of the Granger amps? Have you heard of them? Yeah, I played one of those. Uh, it must have been at an amp show, right? I don't know. I um, I uh, I know of, I know of him, and I think I've modified one before <laughs> um, that someone sent me. Um, but yeah, so I think that I think they were made pretty well. I mean, it looked really nice inside. No, you know, it's like yeah, a take, know. they're hand wired. Take, take on Marshall, you know, I'm taking a Marshall circuit kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I'm yeah. pretty cool. So if there was something I didn't like, I would have remembered it more so than if it was a. You know, real yeah, no, it was the build was solid and everything. No, so I mean, I think it's a, you know fundamentally a, a pretty good amp. You know, yeah, yeah. if you like the tone of it. I suspect it's great. I wish I could say yeah. decisive. Okay, cool. Uh, we got another question from Brian M. Um, and I I know the answer to this, but Dave, I'll I'll throw it to you. Dave, is it possible to address how Steve Stevens uses the Rockaway Archer into his signature amp used on a clean channel or overdrive channel? Now, he uses it as a boost on, on his overdrive channel. Um, he doesn't use the third channel or the boosted channel as amplifier. He always has chosen to use a dedicated boost pedal. Um, for years in his, in his rack, in his system that he's had, he's always had some sort of boost pedal with an EQ following. So that's where that was born. Um, the, the boost pedal has swapped out 10 million times before. Um, but he always had the EQ after, so he could just shape, you know, boost and then shape the tone he wanted for his lead sounds, you know, primarily. So if he wants to accentuate the mid range more with the with the graphic EQ, he can, you know. But it's primarily not for a lot of gain. It's really just pushing the amp a little harder with with the EQ curve he wants to hear for his leads. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Um, we got a question for George. Uh, and I don't, I, I have not heard about this. So George, maybe um, they want to know why don't we hear more about the ten thousand series that you had? Uh, so the ten thousand series was a copy of a sixty-seven super bass, and uh, it's it's very loud and it's organic compared to the twelve thousand to the super lead. Uh, it doesn't have a ton of gain. It kind of does like. Uh, cream and free and uh, if you add a master volume it, it loses a lot of that sort of loud amp speaker breaking up synergy kind of a thing so it's uh you either play it loud or you end up kind of dialing it pretty clean and using pedals and so it's uh it, the appeal isn't as wide as like the the super leads and some of the other things but mm. it's it's great i mean that's another one too you stand in front of that and play that thing and it just kind of it, it shakes your your you know your skeleton and uh that a funny quote about a 10 series we had it on display at an amp show in austin one time <clears throat> and a guy came in and he we, we turned it all the way up and he, he played for a couple of minutes i'll be right back sure and, uh, so he plays for a while and the room's kind of shaking you know it's it's really just it's nuts but he, he finally stops. He puts the guitar down. And he goes, "Man, I feel like I just been kicked by a horse." <laughs> <laughs> go, okay, well, I did my job then. Right, exactly. Production. That's cool. That's cool. Was that what, kind of, it, what, when we say that a plexi can be humbling? Imagine if a, a super lead has, you know, a ubiquitous amount of gain. Does a super lead thing, and if you take some of that away you have to work even harder now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, was that a, kind of like the Paul Kossoff sound? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Green, Paul Kossoff, uh, 
it really does ZZ Top tones great. I always thought it did great like live Zeppelin tones, even though technically that's not what Paige was using. Mm -hmm. I always thought it really kind of got that loud, uh, just enough breakup kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's get back to, while Dave's taking a break here. Let's talk Van Halen. So, and, and let's talk your amp. So what, what amp would you say is like the best amp from uh, Metropolis that would get you that Van Halen tone? Uh, well, if, I'm not making the replicas at this time, but <laughs> the 12,000 series, because that was the 68 Super Lead replica. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I always have to explain that that's only one part of the equation. And you've got to commit to a lot of other stuff to, go <laughs> to really get from point A to point B there. Now, uh, if you wanted something that I build currently, then the Metroplex is going to be That's where you want to go. And that the Metroplex is voiced on this picture lead as the reference. Mm -hmm. And so I'm playing, so that 12,000 series, 68, through this 67 cabinet, and uh, that amp is incredibly bright and aggressive. And when you play it through this cabinet, this cabinet scoops up some of the spiky upper mid-range stuff, the harsh, bright stuff, and pushes like the mid-range forward and makes it kind of more like vocal sounding. And the combination of the really bright amp and the really subdued kind of a cabinet uh, together, it does something really uh, interesting, but it, it takes a second to acclimate too. And I know this, uh, when Dave played the, <coughs> I go, okay, here you go, Dave. Here's the 68 setting on the Metroplex. And he kind of played for a second. He goes, the mids are so weird. And I'm like, yeah, and that, it's by design. And it's because of that amp through this cabinet. And if you, once you wrap your head around it or get used to it, then you start to, like, if you hear old records, like you hear a Montrose record or something. Uh, then you start to you key into it. And you go, oh yeah, okay, it's kind of doing that thing. Mm -hmm. And so the more you play it, the more you start to hear familiar tones. And if you can play a little, you know, I can't do it personally. So I'm I'm hopeless to try to recreate a brown sound, even with that amp, even with the old amp. But if you can, if you got it in the hands, it'll do that thing. That's cool. Very cool. Um, let's see if we, uh, what other questions we have. Uh, Dave, you had to refill your glass there? Uh, yeah, well, that and, uh, yeah, I used the little boy's room, yep. <laughs> <laughs> there I, you go. When, huh? I had to open the window, so it, when I drink scotch, my body temperature tends to go up. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 exactly right. Uh, I have the air conditioning. I have the air conditioning vent pointed right at my head. Um, so uh, it's just because where this computer is, that's what it is. So uh, definitely not. Uh, and you know, we have the air conditioning here on stun as usual. But um, yeah, not going to get hot right now. Uh, uh, we, we we got a funny question here, uh, George. We what gonna... Oh, we lost George. Oh, no, wait, it's being oh, back now. I had a call uh, coming. I had to decline. Ah, uh, yes. Go away. We're, we're That's busy. That's the right? problem with phone. I'll never try to do this on my phone because my, yeah, my but... phone just keeps going. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joy, we had a question. They wanted to know when you're going to be uh, breaking out the news about your new Metal Zone mod that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That was uh, uh, Dana Usman. That, that was a good one. Thank you. <laughs> as funny as that is, my, my personality type is, a, is a, that of being so, a very obsessive. And if something happened and I played a metal zone that just messed me up, I would be compelled to have to recreate that somehow. Well, you know, <laughs> let's pray you know, it doesn't happen. You know, the funny thing is there's a... a Something I accidentally stumbled up, stumbled upon with the, my small box amp. If you omit a resistor, which happened in one amp, right? Um, on the board, it turns literally it into a, a like a fuzz face kind of tone, oh. and, and it's totally not working right, and it totally sounds broken. But it sounds like a 
big, huge tube fuzz face. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I, I was always like, man, this is just so cool. I, yeah, I should maybe do this one day. <laughs> it was, uh, I was uh, like the, uh, um, Oh God, I can't remember what resistor now, but I have it written down. But it was oh, that's funny. Just minus one resistor. It was totally turn. not working properly, it, you know. Like, but it, but it actually still worked, which was great. <laughs> that was the moment where somebody would walk in your shop and go, "What is that? I have to have that," and you'd have to build well, it. Well, like, like in what well, I remember one amp too. Uh, uh, you know, I was getting like no volume out of the amp, and like it was really quiet, but it still sounded like the amp. I'm like. What's wrong with it? You know, and I'm like, finally, I realized, hey, the presence knob isn't uh, doing anything. Hmm. There's no little scratch or nothing on, on you know, the, the old presence knob. And the phaser. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, there, there's no ground. The wire had broken off the board <laughs> from the presence pot, so there's no ground there. But everything was just quiet. I'm like, going, huh? It's kind of hmm. cool. <laughs> <laughs> It's just like it, it, uh, it, it, it. It's like I was messing around with someone's amp, and we did a pento triode switch on it for him, right? So you know, to reduce the power a lot. Yeah. But when you're in that lower power mode, if you then use the impedance selector, and you mismatch it, it acts literally like a power attenuator. It just knocks it down more. It's not like it gets bad sounding or anything. It's just like, mm -hmm. wow, that's cool. <laughs> hey, let me ask you Hey, a question. there's a feature we can add. <laughs> there you go. Well, things you discover, right, through mistakes. Yeah. Always. It always happens that way. Um, what about using a, a, vari a variac? Do you guys I, – even I was thinking about this the other day. I mean, is, is it – I saw a picture of Steve Stevens using uh, a Variac on tour in Europe, mm -hmm. Dave, um, and it brought me thinking. Okay, he's using a uh, he's using your Friedman Steve Stevens model, which I imagine is not a non -master, master. It's got a master volume, but yet he's still using a, a Variac on it. Just curious about that. You know, well, and, and the the reason Steve uses a Variac uh, is to um, adjust for voltage fluctuations in his line. Uh, he likes his amps a little bit under 120 volts. So more around 115. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it just, there's a kind of a sweet spot there for him. And, uh, and he, he's basically come to rely on having a very act so he can kind of tweak it in just a little bit from the standard thing. Cause when you're on tour, the, the, I mean, like when you're on a big tour, the the voltage is generally pretty consistent because you're carrying your own power system, and mm -hmm. and so it's it, whatever it might be, but it could be 121 volts, uh, and you know he likes it at 115, so he just knocks it down a little bit. But depending on what other situations he's in, um, it can uh, you can uh, kind of adjust what where where you like the tone, you know, and it could it could be anywhere, you know, hell, it could be 90, it could be 100, 110. Yeah, you know. And now, uh, on the last ACDC tour, I got to go back and look at the rigs, and the heart of each guy's rigs. It, it was Angus and it was Steve Young, and the heart of each of their rigs <clears throat> is an enormous Japanese power regulator thing, and I think current on demand also. So it never, you know, runs yeah, out. Yeah. Current. So these enormous uh, power conditioning things, and and they can adjust them in one volt. And, and uh, you know, the ang I, I forget he was a little bit lower, like one thirteen or something. And uh, Steve, they had they actually had real old JTM forty fives in the rig, and I think yeah. that was at one seventeen. Uh, but they also had EL thirty fours in those forty five one hundreds, which originally would have. Uh, required KT sixty sixes, and I don't know if they were. You know, you can change the impedance to compensate or do some other things. Um, or who knows they, what the output transformer is really? Yeah, if they're original or what? Um, and I didn't get to dig that deep to really kind of scrutinize. But then I went out front, and it sounded like ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another point too. Uh, 
that speaks sort of to the Variac thing and like the uh, brown box and stuff. Every one of these old amps uh, was the power transformer was designed to operate at a particular line voltage. And it could have been 117, could have been 115, 112, 110. Uh, so all my old amps and any old amps that come across the bench, I'll, I'll use the Variac and I'll measure the heater voltage on the tubes. And so you want it to see 6.3 volts AC on the tubes for the heaters, the filaments that heat them up. And so measure the 6.3 and then dial the Variac until it's exactly 6.3. Mm. Make a note of what voltage is that. And uh, like on the 68, it's like 117. On the uh, 67, it's a little less. On my 45100, it's like 109. So, yeah, because of the 110 volt line that they wanted that to see on that one, right? And so, yeah, and so yeah. you have to, in, in my opinion, you have to start there so you know what was it designed to operate correctly at, and then once you know that, now you, now you can use that information to decide: Do I want to vary act lower? Mm -hmm. uh, you really don't want to go higher than that, especially right. original transformers and old stock tubes and stuff, because you're going to be running them past their intended design parameters and it, all you're doing is shortening lifespan at that point mm -hmm. transformers and oh yeah doing all that fun stuff right yeah that's no good that's a... <laughs> like the the old van halen i turned it to 140 oh. <laughs> but he was lying about that right i mean he he really wasn't doing that here here's the thing here's the thing um <laughs> all, all that i know about it all is that that knob could have been anywhere at any time. Mm. It's what he was feeling for the day. You know what I mean? Just like turn, turn, turn. You know, it's like, and generally speaking, if there's a knob to turn it up, he's going to try it. Right. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> more gain, more boost, more something. I'll turn it up. Now, so <laughs> the story that John Sir told me when he worked on that app, I hope it's okay to repeat it, uh, is that he – fixed up a few things it was mostly stock just yeah. like you said mm -hmm. he said uh ed came in he had the very act <clears throat> and everything on 10 and start playing and dialing the very act back until as he's playing when he plays hard the, the indicator light would dim yeah he plays and you see it squished down and then and then it comes back and then and he stopped there. And I, I think he said it was 85, 90 volts or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, it, I mean, that seems completely feasible. I'm inclined to believe that. But I'm inclined to believe that um, anything was game at any time, yeah, depending on how. It's like, oh, I, I like it today. I like it at 140. <laughs> and every and and the tubes are melting. <laughs> well, I, I mean, you know, I, and, I, and the other I, thing, and the other interesting thing is, uh, you know, the other story about that is, you know, early on, you know, back back in the day, there there wasn't match tubes. No, that wasn't a, a thing. You had a box of tubes, and they were just random. You know, you they, the they could be, store. yeah, they could be all over the place. So so. So the, the deal was early on, they would just, you know, like, hey, a tube would glow red or something, and they'd just pop a new tube in, you know. And, well, they, and the match, there was no match. They would just throw the tubes in, hope for the best. You know, like, <laughs> no bias, no nothing. And, and the thing is, is, like, you can have radically different, um, you know, one tube could be at 50 milliamps or 60 milliamps. The other tube could be at 30. It could be all over the map, right? So, you know, then this amp is dimed, right? Yeah, exactly. Then this amp is dimed, right? And, uh, you know, you're, you're just they, – they would blow up output transformers because these tubes would short, and they would do all sorts of nasty stuff and, the, and everything. And, and Jose was sitting there replacing output transformers on, like, the first tour and stuff. And then what I was told by Rudy Laren was that uh, – Eventually, Jose matched tubes for them. Ah. So, so essentially, then that eliminated them blowing up the output transformers and everything else because mm -hmm. you're just not randomly tubes going, you know, bread plating and going crazy. You know, it's just, it wasn't now, it, this, arcing. 
is this going to be the era then when the you hear the roadies telling the stories about having the oven mitts and changing tubes right during the set? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he's always been that way, and it's actually still to this day. So, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. I mean, they're fans, big fans, blowing on the damn amps, you know, because uh, you know you well, the tubes weren't matched, and the deal, and the supposed deal. I'm not going to pretend to know everything about this. But the supposed deal is like, you know, from from where, um, from what I've been told and everything is that, you know, he would just, the, the bias was all the way up or all the way, the highest current in the amp, you know, turn, well, that's what I mean by turned all the way up. That's not really all the way up, but the highest current in the amp just, you know, randomly just, hey, there's a pot, let's turn it up. Hmm. Right, and so uh, in the era, like the, the the '68 one specifically, we would have had just a little raw slide pot. Yeah, yeah. Who slide it? And you just let's play with it. Hot, and there's very little bias voltage. The amp's really idling at a super high current. And uh, yeah, but and, but that that's the thing we discovered. It's like, yep. Although uh, they did that, <laughs> then they then they ran the amp with a variac. Variac. So the variac then knocks all the voltages down in the amp. Right. Um, so by doing that, I mean it's it's like kind of passable. It's it's you have, you know, maybe uh, maybe it's it's three hundred and odd some volts on the plates, and mm -hmm. it, it's uh, roughly around fifty milliamp bias roughly on the and tubes. That, that's and that, that's acceptable. <laughs> but if you turn that variac up. With that bias setting, if you oh. turn that very act up, you're going to have a meltdown catastrophic. of catastrophic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. So that's exactly what you and I started doing in the Metro Ooh. Friedman, which was just a super lead, kind of with the Ed specs or whatever. But when you would turn the very act on, the power transformer had a special tap, drops all the voltages, mm -hmm. and Variac. we were the bias, turning the bias up to 50 milliamps. Yeah. So there you get the hotter tubes, you get the lower voltages, you get the extra saturation. And uh, I, I do that also to a, a lesser degree in the Metroplex too, because it just, yeah. it's a different tonal flavor. It's a different feel. It works. Yeah, it gives, it gives uh, by boosting the, the, the bias when it's very act down low, you're getting like this, this gainier, sustainier, hmm. more compression. Mm -hmm to the, the notes and stuff. And it really kind of works. Uh, it, it, it works really well. Yeah. But I always say yep. like in order to get all that tone and, and, and everything in order to set an amp up sort of like it was, mm -hmm. you really need the real six A sevens. You need the real Sylvanias. You need, yep. uh, and I've argued with this with people before about it. Um, uh, you know, well, I don't like how the this negative feedback tap is with these tubes. I go, are you running six A sevens with it? No, I'm using a different thing. Well, then, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> but but yep. you have to you have to give the whole recipe in order to get the results. Otherwise, the results you can you can fudge the results with different tubes, but you might set it up a little differently. Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. That's just really basic, but I'm not going into too much detail. <laughs> no, it's interesting. We got a question from actually from Keith Bears. Uh, he wants to know, Dave, any update uh, ETA on the DS pedal? I'm not sure what that, that is. Dirty Shirley pedal? Dirty Shirley pedal. Yeah, there you go. Dirty Shirley August. Pedal. August, August, everyone. Sorry. Uh, Let me just say sorry now and don't bitch, bitch at me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Why? What happened? It was delayed? No, I mean, no. I mean, no, it's not necessarily late it's it's just when you're doing like large production it takes a while to get everything uh going in a, a large production scale so um uh it just like the beod pedal that came out last august well mm -hmm. that's when the uh that's when the dirty show is going to come out ah okay so, cool and along with the bucks and boost pedal and somewhere in the questions, although I lost my iPad because the charge, even though it's plugged in, ran out somehow. Mm. Um, uh, someone asked about what that's a cool pedal to boost your amps, specifically with me. 
Well, we got a new boost pedal coming out, so that's the pedal. <laughs> it's the oh, Buxom cool. Boost. I, it's the Buxom Boost. That, that, that works really well because it's got some EQ. Um, it's got a tight knob and a volume knob and some EQ uh, capability of it, so you can make it sound however you want the damn boost to sound. So I also have a boost pedal in the works that will be coming out. High and voltage. It's high voltage, so it's it's the circuit from the Metroplex, but with some EQ controls and uh, running off nine volts. So that's in the works too. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you know, on our George, on our new tube pedals, we we did run, we did wind up running it off. It's funny, you, the same little voltage thing you're using, like we talked about before. Yeah. Um. And originally, we were running them at twelve volts, and and uh, we actually reduced it to nine volts on the yeah. input um even though technically that's you know running the heaters well we have tubes so it's running the heaters low mm -hmm. but it sounded better <laughs> we liked it better yep. the heaters a little I, you know a little dipped um and, and it worked fine i tried some different chips and stuff the different inductors on the flyback and everything i wound up right back with the same 555 timer you know the the ubiquitous proven circuit mm -hmm. and nine volts you get like uh 200 out and yeah and you, and you can do the tubes with it too so there may be something like that in the future also yep yep you can yep yeah it's great yeah the two new tube pedals that we have um are uh are very cool okay they're, so they're, they're different what? they're different than the um than the other pedals that we have, and they're different than my amp sounds too. So uh, that was my question. And I, are you going to try to take like the the Brown Eye preamp and put it into a pedal? Well, are you doing no. The t what we have now is the Motor City Drive, which mm -hmm. is a I would call it a warm fat tube overdrive. Um, okay. It's not uh, specifically targeted at any of my sounds. Uh, it's it's just one we've created and and it's a uh, it's a cool you know it's not really like a heavy it's not like a heavy metal thing it's not like a it's not super aggressive it's 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 warm fat more vintagey um, you know great tube overdrive and then there's the you know the um, the fuzz the fuzz fiend the fuzz fiend pedal uh, which is uh, a very cool it's a tube fuzz pedal with a you know a kind of a rage switch where you push it and it kind of oscillates and then you can kind of roll your volume knob down and change the gain on the on the pedal and it'll change pitch and oscillation and hmm. that's that's fun too yeah. but it, it, it's not like a, the the fuzz pedal uh, in in the state without the switch on the rage switch on is uh it's not overly fuzzy it it, it you can use it into an already distorted amp and all it will do is change the character of the distortion to more of a fuzz overtone. More like a so, treble. Well, no, but it, it'll change it. Uh, I mean, it has a decent amount of gain, but it'll change the overall character of, say, like, kind of a, a, like a, a hard rock distortion to, uh, you know, more of a fuzz tone character, more of an alt fuzz, you know, like more stoner rock kind of... Um, tone to it um and then you can go crazy with it with the other features but uh it, it's it's fun george george pahone stated that it was the one of the best fuzzes he's ever heard oh really and he uses a lot he uses a lot of fuzzes yeah george would know yeah, yeah. and, he, and he, he he just got one so he's happy now oh i'll have to grab one that's good that's a good that's a it's good different, you know it's different it's not like you know if you're not totally into fuzz i mean you know what if you're not totally into fuzz this might straddle between the two, uh, uh, straddle between the two universes of of, uh, of more normal and more super crazy, you know. What? It's a good gateway fuzz. Yeah, maybe a good <laughs> gateway. It's a good gateway drug. <laughs> It'll lead you down the other path. Of, It'll lead but... you down the. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, we got a good question from uh, Keith Felber at Guitar Guru Network. He wants to know. Uh, Dave, who's and George, uh, favorite recorded Ed tone? Um, oh, geez. <laughs> um, for me, ooh, I I have. Well, you know what? They're all good. How's that? No, mm -hmm. um, 
That's a good You know what? Not the first record. Mm, yeah. I, see, I, for, I would say um, for me, there's three standouts for me. Um, that would be the second record, mm -hmm. Fair Warning, yeah. and 1984. And they're all different, even though they were the same amp. Mm. I like the, the 1984. I love the uh, cleanliness of it. Uh, it was cleaner than the other records, uh, but man, it just had this cool brown thing to it. Like you know, you, you talk about the the, uh, the Panama or whatever, you know that one little uh, that little slow part, you know, where you know, yeah, uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. The, the, the oh yeah, the, nah, 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 nah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, I mean that when he when he strikes the low E, gonk. And it was like you just go, oh yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Dude, then when he does this, that that. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. the fucking greatest. The, all yeah. those little uh, overtones of those stuff, and you know, and I think during that time he was listening to a lot of Alan Holdsworth on that record. Mm. Some of the lead playing on that record was just crazy, especially some of the outro stuff. I'm like. Drop dead legs and all that, all that stuff was crazy shit. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say too, Panama. As far as like the, uh, the just pure dirty sleaziness of the tone, yeah. but then when he plays the single notes, it's so clear yeah. and everything is so present. There's no, there's like no downside to it. Uh, but I would also confess that I really like the the drier kind of things that happen on the second record too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, beautiful right, girls and, and, and all that you know yeah it's so much just like a guitar and an old marshall on that record it sounds that sounds that sounds like to me like the amp you know you know those you'll know exactly what i'm talking about you know the old marshall cabs that are kind of light you know they're yeah. not super heavy and they're light and when you <laughs> knock on them they sound really hollow yeah like really hollow to me, that amp blow. It sounds like it's blowing up one of those really hollowy sounding, uh, 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 like real knocky four by twelves. That's what it sounds like in Van Halen too to me. And the mic is just far enough off the center of the coat. Yeah. Get the the woodiness too. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, and some of the the squeals and stuff that he does are just so vicious on that record. It just yeah. like when you hear it, the amp's just like, oh yeah. Yeah, I, I do have to admit though, there's some stuff on uh, uh, "Women and Children First, too that is really great, you know. Yeah, um, but but yeah, you know, two fair warning eighty four. Yeah. you know, it's I won't I won't say the first record. So I don't think it's the best tone. I don't think I so won't. either. I love it. I love it. I mean, eruption, you know, yeah, was fantastic. yeah no, that was classic. Yeah, but. yeah. I but I think you have to put it in context and just. It may not be his best tone captured ever, but the just the historic value and the impact of it when it hit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just changed the game, right? From oh, absolutely. I mean, so you have to you have to give it props just for being revolutionary at that time. Oh, there's no oh, doubt. Yeah. No doubt. No, it was the Jimi Hendrix you know, of uh, you know the 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 sev the late seventies, shall we say? You know, and and when when I, I assume Jimi Hendrix. When he was first heard in the '60s, also was like, "Holy crap, what is well, this?" He scared the hell out of all the top British guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they all went to see him, and they were like, "Okay, I'm it's time to put the guitar down. We're done." Right. Yeah, right. yeah, we're done. Yeah, we're done. You know, and and likewise, you know, everyone uh, later with Van Halen, as soon as that came out, they're just like, "Oh, crap!" Yeah, I have to. I have <laughs> what to do is that. this? Uh, yeah. Now I got to beat this. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Holy crap. No. Super intimidation. There's no doubt about yeah. it. Um, we had a couple other questions. I don't know how much longer you guys want to go. Um, uh, Ask well, the questions. Try to get those questions in from everyone so we don't miss anyone. This long, right? That, that you'd George? be there forever. That'd be 3 30 in the morning, uh, you know, my time by the time you're done with that. <laughs> Someone wants to know, did you guys talk about amp slaving yet? Chubby45 wants to know. Well, amp slaving, I mean, it, it's sort of like with a power station. You know, that's yeah. really amp slaving. 
Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Molly wants to know. <laughs> Easier. So, Dave, the the uh, buffer bay has that released yet? Uh yes. Now it's released. Okay. So, they, uh, and the pedal boards. They 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 were supposed to wait for a few more days, but they actually went early, so they're they're released now. Oh, good. All right. So, Molly, no, you don't have the only one in production. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Jay Douglas Adams, what capacitor do you find closest to the original mustards? I was going to try original CDE WMF series. I don't know what that is. Do higher value ceramic caps 1.5 V to 3 KV give more vintage Marshall tone compared to mica? That's serious detail right there. Oh, well, you want? Oh, wait, should we answer the the cup the coupling caps first, George? Yeah, you have to separate them into type and application. And uh, well, I mean, most like mustards, synergy, royal mustards. Uh, yeah, um, uh, they got to the point. You know, Sozo was leading the pack, and Synergy took over, and they got to the point where I could swap a real mustard in with well, those caps and not tell the difference. Yeah. So as far as mustard goes, if that's what you're shooting for. Uh, in your tone. Um, it's not to say that any other cap is not a good cap. It just depends on what you're going for. Um, but if you're looking for vintage mustard cap sound, Synergy Raw mustard caps are, are kind of the way to go. Those, and, and the thing is... Uh, Available at Valve Storm. Want, um, as far as tech, yeah, go to Valve Storm. Yeah. Um, the, if you want to get technical about it, what you're looking for to capture the mustard thing is a film and foil type self-healing capacitor uh so there's a lot there's a lot of different ones you can go on ebay and buy lots of old ones or whatever mm -hmm. but you know, honestly just go buy them it, even when i was building the replicant amps i answered this question literally on every one should i invest in nos mustard caps and i mean it got to the point where i said no you, you don't have to mm -hmm. put your money into old glass instead yeah yeah, that's where I put my money. I have I have some old glass. No, no power tubes, unfortunately. Oh, oh no, I have <laughs> six V6s. I have some old power six V6s. But other than that, I, I need some 34s. OK, so uh, I know Nikos has asked this question. I, I, did I just say axed? He asked this question. That's um, the scotch talking. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. Yeah. <laughs> this, bo this bottle's taking a bit of a dip. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's. Don't yeah, start well, that's Mark. What's that? Uh, Don't start wait. looking on us. That's a <laughs> that's a little more of a dip. Oh, yeah, wow. Let me see. Let me see. Wow! See Speak up, Dave. Let me see. Let me see. I don't. Yeah. Can you see it? No. Holy yeah. crap! Yeah. That's a little more of a dip. Yeah, I, I'm not close. Oh, you're you're doing you're you're getting there though. Yeah, I'm getting know. there. It's not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Let George, me tell you. Let me tell you from experience though. The the last show I drank the majority of a bottle. Um, not so good. No, <laughs> that's taking it. That's taking it a little too far. Yes. No. No. Don't. Don't no. do too. Yeah. The whole bottle will be good. Not too bad. I think. I think the. Uh, they think the prerequisite is maybe half the bottle. Yeah, I think I have at the most. So let me get to Nico's question because I know. What's that, George? The thing with good scotch is it's so natural and it's only organic that even if you go over, you know, what you really should. It's not going to be that toxic kind of a hangover, you know. You're definitely going to know if you drink too much. There's no doubt about that. Right. But it's yeah, but no, you're right. It it, it sits clean. You sits clean. You're not really poisoning yourself. You just you your liver has to process a lot, you know. And you've got to, <laughs> you've got to sweat it out. But it's not like you know if you drink too much Jägermeister or something, and you've really got that toxic like poison kind of a. Oh. That's horrible. Yeah. No, yeah, like anything, fine. like any good liquor like that. Well, actually, you know what, though? Some of the other whiskeys, uh, there's too much sugar in them, and they, yeah. they, they, they mess with you bad. No question. Um, scotch sits pretty clean. Tequila sits really clean if it's good mm -hmm. tequila. Good. Mm -hmm. uh, as long as you don't mix it with, like, uh, margaritas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't, you, no, no sweet. Oh, the sweet sweets will kill you. Yeah. yeah. It, same with that. If you stick with Añejo tequila, you know, this is going to be uh, distilled and clean. It's pure. It's pure ingredients. You know, 
it can still do some damage, but it's not anything like the poisoning you get if you. You know, some of the worst, some of the worst things if you drink like an IPA all night. <laughs> yeah, that can be. If you drink IPAs all night or something. Oh, man, that'll kill you. Man, yeah. I'll tell you. The next day, you're just like, oh my god, oh jeez. I've had that too. Yeah, what IPAs happened? will kill you. Yep. I yeah. had that at a, at a company party. I had like three or four of them and. Didn't realize it. I mean, it just came on. I was just like, wow. And then the next day, I was really ripped, just bad. Um, so Nikos asked this question: Do the he wants to talk Transformers guys? Do the old ones age and change sound? What other parts age in an amp and change the tone? He want, uh, and then he says, pretty much, why do the old amps sound so good? Thoughts? Uh, okay, I have, I have several answers to that. Okay. You want me to go first? Yeah, you're the guest. Go for it. Go okay, for it. So Transformers. Uh, the way Transformers were wound uh, 40 or 50 years ago is different than they're wound now and, in general, less consistent. And just like with pickups, if the winds are not the same consistency, the same pattern, the same tightness on each wrap, or if you're winding on a cardboard bobbin and it's not perfectly geographically square, uh, geometrically square, then you get inconsistencies and then you get quirks. And so that can be a factor. And also the, the steel uh, decades ago was not as consistent or in general as high quality. And I, I wanna say, I'm making a blanket statement there that you could argue for weeks on end about that general blanket statement. So allow me some latitude here just to say in general, the steel was not as consistent or high quality. <clears throat> so the uh, uh, the metallurgy now is gonna be much more precise. Uh, if you take an old, uh, let's say a Drake output transformer, like you would find uh, in, in the 45 or in the 67, <clears throat> this transformer is going to have a relatively complex wind it's going to have several interleaves, which is where one part of the wind stops, another part of the wind is over top of it, and it goes back to that previous part of the wind. And, and that's done for fidelity and bandwidth. So it's more complex of a wind, and it's also, uh, in general, a much lower grade of steel. So it's, it's hi-fi in one sense with the wind, but it's lo-fi in the sense of the steel, and that combines to make a very distinct sounding transformer. So in that regard, yes. And then uh, the Dagnell, like the 100 watt Dagnell OT comes along and that's M6 steel, but it's 120 tiny, very thin laminations. So an efficient core and, uh, and a much simpler wind, less interleaves. And so that has a different distinct characteristic. And now if you start to try to recreate that, uh, Dave and I both have done it like the, the DAG now we've done it with the M6 steel, M6 anneal, hand annealed steel, uh, M19 steel, and they all have different characteristics. Mm. And at the end of the day, you just kind of pick the one that really you like the sound of the most or the one that reflects the 68 era one or the 70 era one or whatever. And you kind of, you go down that road until you find something that you can go back and forth between a modern part and a vintage part and go, okay, they might not be exactly the same, but they're, they're different shades of the same color. And it's definitely, this part has got to the point where it's not a detriment tonally, but let's run with this. And so now you've spent weeks and months and years and you've picked your output transformer. And then you start scrutinizing the power transformer and the current ratings and how much it sags. And then you start, uh, you know, tubes, I'll leave out of this discussion for now. So we can mention, if you start looking at components, and we've already mentioned mustard caps. And a mustard cap was very consistent. It was an efficient cap. It's self-healing. So if it starts to fail, it can sometimes rebuild its own dielectric by charging and discharging. So it's a robust part. And it's not really overly inductive, but a lot of the other parts that you find in vintage amps tend to be more inductive than the parts that you find in modern amps. Hmm. That means that every component you see, like open up your vintage amp and look on the board, and every one of those resistors and capacitors is going to have some small but 
but measurable inductance. And anytime you combine resistors and capacitors and inductors, you're creating little audio filters. And if you, if you have a capacitor here that has a certain amount of inductance, it's rolling off some low end. And if you have a resistor over here that's more inductive, it's going to create maybe an oscillation, a ringing, a, a certain frequency, like on the plate of a tube or something. And you have all these things happening. You have this, uh, this old thinner walled wire and it's running next to the chassis and it's going to have capacitance between the wire and the chassis or it might be inductive depending on, depending on where it's running and stuff. And so if all of these tiny little minute quirks, non-perfect components, and you put them all together and then what comes out the other end is some unique sounding vintage amplifier. And even if you measure all of those, those original parts, and get the same kind of parts and you build an exact replica and you you go back and forth and play it and you play it it still doesn't sound exactly the same and that's when you really start splitting hairs and looking for nuance and reconsidering everything and now you build an exact replica right down to the ohm of a, a vintage amp and you play it but it's got a lot more low end than the vintage amp and so you're kind of back to the drawing board. Well, why is that? And where is that low end building up? And how is it that the values are the same? I can put the old tubes in the replica and the characteristic of the, the new amp is still there and stuff. And you, you just, just when you think you're reaching the finish line, you realize you're right back at the start. <laughs> if you're obsessed with this stuff, then that's where, you know, that's where this thing comes in. And I'm, I go back to the input jack and go, here's what the signal looks like here. Mm -hmm. and here's the first gain stage. And here's how many harmonics have built up after the first gain stage. And here's how it's clipping when it hits the second gain stage. And uh, yeah, I've lapped myself and I'm coming back around. So those are, but that's some of the factors that I can, I can actually measure and document and say, these are factors that make an old out amp sound a certain way and, and a modern recreation of it sounds different. To add to that, why is it that certain, uh, you know, amps of the same era can sound different? Tolerant. Oh. Tolerant, parts tolerances, um, uh, like for instance, Marshall, Mm -hmm. If they ran out of something, they just substituted something else in that was close. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen amps with 82K plate resistors before uh, where they're supposed to be 100K. Uh, I've seen uh, miswirings in amps um, that have existed from the factory originally. I've seen uh, uh, slightly different capacitors uh, because that's all they had at the time and they wanted to get the amp out the door. And it's relatively close. I mean, it's, you know, it's in the ballpark, um, meaning it, it won't sound radically different. It, it'll sound a little different. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've there's seen, tubes, uh, and then forget about tubes, you know, whatever. I've seen a handful of 50-watt Plexi Marshalls where the first capacitor on the cathode, which is polarized, it has a specific plus and minus. Backwards. Is installed backwards, and the amp is yeah. been, like for 40 years. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I've seen that too, actually. And I saw another one where the, I think it was George Lynch's amp, where the uh, first and se the, 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 the first and second filtering stages, the tubes that they were filtering were swapped. <laughs> so in other words, uh, the higher voltage was on the first tube and the lower voltage was on the second tube. <laughs> And um, I, I think that might be a thing, though, because I, uh, you know what? In in old in in the old nailer amps that Dan Russell, for another Detroit brother, uh, 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 designed, um, the first two gain stages were swapped. So the higher voltage was in the first stage, and the lower voltage was in the cathode follower. And I think you see that. And, part and the the amp didn't sound right if you flipped them. It, it, it only hit that amp particular only sounded right the other way. So, uh, you know, I don't know. You can play with that stuff. 
it, it, it can be good or bad. I'm, it's, it's just arbitrary. You know, it's like whatever you decide you like. Mm -hmm. And you can get sucked in too, because <clears throat> I'll take an old amp and I'll, uh, let's say I build a replica of it, hook them up on the amp switcher. So I'm hitting a foot switch and it's the same guitar, the same cable, the same speaker, just switching the amp. And you just, I mean, sometimes for hours. And I've spent I mean, more time than I care to admit dialing two things to sound exactly the same. <clears throat> and I'm playing a certain chord or a certain note or a certain way. And I tweak and I tweak and I tweak until they sound the same. I know where you're going. <laughs> and then I hit a different chord. And they're and it's totally different. different. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's mine. Yeah, so. Yeah. Cool. Should have made pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> It's less complex, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's like right. let's just open a pizza place. It's it's a lot easier. Uh, that, believe me, people will be like, okay, so tell me where did that cheese originate from? And oh, jeez. <laughs> um, so we made um, the cheese from the the Flint water. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it tastes so special. I don't. I don't think. I don't think anyone's gonna eat it then. But. <laughs> We got a few more questions, and then we should probably wrap up. But um, Lou uh, Sequoia wants to know, what's so special about UDO's Pipper JTM45? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there's there's YouTube clips of that one, and it, it's just a really fantastic sounding one. I don't uh, even know what that is. Uh, it's just um, – is that the one you, – you know the, the German video – uh, on YouTube, there's a few clips, and he's playing the the Bats Toller Burst. Oh, I think so. Yeah, uh, I, I I think it's that one. I have to I'll have to go back and check, but um, hmm. uh, I don't know that I know the specs. I think we probably discussed it on the uh, the Metro Forum, but a lot of it I'm sure was speculative. Right. And uh, you know, when I hear it, it's. Uh, to me, it's just that thing of a great instrument with a great amp and a great speaker. I mean, got... again, you know, you no matter. I, I I'm not exactly sure what this amp is or exactly anything, but remember, people keep into account the player. Um, a, a a great player that knows how to play these kind of amps will make them sound unbelievable. Uh, another player will not will make them sound okay. Some other players will make them sound just awful. Mm -hmm. um, so keep that into account. I mean, it's not all. It's. It, I mean, there's there's a lot to this, but but there's a lot to the player and how the amp is sounding. Well, if you look at a guy like uh, Pete Thorne or JD Simo or uh, Doug Rappaport, uh, uh, Rappaport. Um, you know, these guys on that caliber, it doesn't matter what they plug into. It, they have an inherent ability to find something that any amp does well, that it excels at, and focus on that and do that yeah. thing and, and not play the things that maybe it doesn't do so well. Or right, of, right, right, right. A great player will find a way to make something sound great and musical just inherently, just naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. So a couple more questions, um, and then I think it's time for some pizza, because now I'm getting freaking hungry. <laughs> <laughs> That's because you've been drinking. I know. I'm. I, I'm. I'm seriously like thinking Domino's or whatever uh, is going to deliver because I'm really hungry. Whatever's late. Yeah, it's late there. So whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever will still deliver. Yeah, whatever's <laughs> open and will deliver. I'm. I'm. You know, I, I have to. I have to say though, yeah, my my son loves Domino's, right? Who's six year old kid, but. Um, but uh, you know what? It has improved over the years. I must say it has improved. It's, uh, it's, you know, it, in a pinch, it's not bad. It, yes. Uh, uh, you know, I, it's funny. I, you know, the, it's, I'd not rather, great. I, it's not great. I'd rather go pizza hut personally. I'm like more of a pizza hut guy. Like late night pizza hut is my thing, but you know, not not that I do it that often, but you know, Domino's has gotten better. My son, for some reason, loves uh, Papa John's. What were you going to say, George? Now, see, if I lived in Southern California, 
I'd be hit I, because of taco trucks. Because if you have forget, a, yeah, just go get a taco truck. Yeah, and then taco truck outside, it, it, I'd be hopeless. There's no way I couldn't go eat tacos. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, which which is which might be what I'm gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> Since it's much earlier here. <laughs> yeah, you got you still got some time. In fact, uh, the taco trucks really aren't out yet. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I mean they they come out on the late side generally. So and like got, outside of the amp show, that one, you know, George. Yeah, right. Yep, down the street. Oh man, that one's fantastic. Taco Tacos Reyes. Oh. Um, man, that one is just spectacular. Oh, now I'm dying. I'm so hungry. Yeah. That's not, that's not even... <laughs> they don't. Have, they don't have good Mexican food in Florida, do they? Uh, there's one place by me, um, which of course is closed by now, uh, but they're pretty good. Um, La Bamba is that. That's they have two places by me, which is really good. But other than that, not like California. No. That's for sure. No, no, no. Um, so speaking of George Lynch, I'm, uh, Chubby S45 wants to know: Can you confirm that Slash and Lynch? Shared the same SIR amp. I don't know the answer to that. I heard that. Not that I know. No, uh, meaning the same when they recorded a record. Yeah, like that's or, that, that. The AFD amp slashes AFD was the same as uh, Lynch when he recorded. They both rec recorded using that same amp. I had re read that somewhere recently. I that might be true. That might be true. Um, but so, uh, Slash has a number thirty-four amp. Mm -hmm. That though that he required from SAR, I don't know in what fashion, mm -hmm. um, which he used on like the second record, um, which is what they used, which I've worked on before, which is incredibly bright amp, um, uh, with some modifications to it, uh, with sixty five fifties in it or or KTAs, I can't quite remember, uh, which is what they used to make that slash. Uh, that that Santiago used to make that slash uh, AFD amp, um, mm -hmm. um, but uh, wasn't wasn't the Lynch one? Wasn't that number thirty six? Yeah, the SIR amp is, was number thirty six. If I if I ah. there's also number thirty nine in the mix. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all a little bit the the one that the slash owns now is number I think I believe. You know, I could be wrong in these numbers, but I believe it's number thirty-four. Um, I think you're right. Is is a is a Frank Levi yeah. um, uh, tweak? He's uh, the guy. Need to fill us in on that. And uh, the original amp, the thirty-six, right? I think is the John, the Caswell amp. Oh, uh, sure. I, I don't yeah. know. You have you have a uh, like a five hundred page blog on your forum, George. So I you should you should think. know all about it. <laughs> um, Literally, it's like it's like so long. I can't even like. I, I don't even know how anyone reads the whole thing. Um, now, was thirty six the super tremolo? Yeah, I think so. I believe so. I too. could be wrong in these numbers. Like someone else might chime in and say, "Yeah, you're fucking wrong." Thirty four was the tremolo, and this was that. But <laughs> uh, but I, ha I I I've worked on one amp that he has that is says SIR on the side. And it, I, I, I recall it's number 34. And the, the famous amp that got stolen or went missing from SAR is the number 36 amp. Right. God knows where that amp is. It's probably worth a lot of money now. And that which was a super tremolo amp. This other one I worked on is a JC-800 amp that had some mods on it. Right. Yeah. yeah okay. Incredibly bright. Like, ridiculously bright. Like, wow, that's bright. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, like, that's bright. Super bright. Like, rip the paint off the walls bright. Um, I mean, like, presence and treble almost zero bright. <laughs> but it, it had a sound. It had a thing. It, it, has a, it has a thing to it. And with the right so. speaker cabinet, could be great. Right. The right speaker cabinet, the right guitar, the right touch, the right person, you know, it, it, it's, all, it's all relative, you know? Yep. Well, we've got a... A ton more questions, but I mean, I think we're. Oh, come on, ask like four more. Okay, all right. You... <laughs> Why so we not? Got... We've we've gone. You know what? We I, I know everyone's complaining about the length of the shows and uh, whatever, but uh, you know, I'm sorry. When it just goes, it goes. And if we got more questions, let's answer them. 
right. You're, as long I, as you guys are still alive. I'm I'm going. You all right, George? I'm good. I'm great. All right, cool. So we got a question. Uh, Bill Camporan says, I'm, f I'm afraid to ask, especially Valve oh. guys, but oh, no. is there a solid state amp that you guys, that sounds good to you? I know I have my opinion, but I'll leave it to you guys. You guys. Uh, um, George? <laughs> there's, there's not one that works for me because I can't manage my expectations. I'm so uh, just hopelessly a uh, non-master volume Marshall guy mm -hmm. that I, I can't, I can never acclimate, but I will say that, uh, you know, when I was a teenager sneaking into the local rock club, there was a guy playing <clears throat> three, four sets a night on a solid state Randall. With no, that was great. RG guitars and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made it work. And then it wasn't long after that, then, uh, you know, Dime Pack comes out. You know, mm -hmm. He made it work. He created a whole new thing with it, really. I just uh, – I never was a player who was able to adjust to it and make it work for me. Yeah, well, look, so, I mean – God, Dave. Let me – let me um, – I'm going to leave modelers out of this equation. I'm just going to okay. talk That's where I was about going. Amps because modelers are like a whole different category and, and like – I, I kind of just don't want to even touch on that because it's a big kind of sore subject. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> solid state amps. I agree with George. I mean, I, in some respects, it never worked for me, but uh, there was, uh, you know, the RG series from Randall fucking ages ago yeah. was a pretty damn good amp. I mean, I've even heard one in recent times going, that's not bad, you know, that's, 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 I, I, I get that. I get why people were using it, and, and, and it wasn't a bad amp. Um, the, uh, you know what? I have to say the, the new, the Boss Cantana amps. Yeah, the Katana. The, the Katana. Katana. Yeah. For the price, uh, they are um, pretty cool. I mean, not th they're a usable amp. Um, they're not your tube amp, mm -hmm. but... They, you know, for uh, the three hundred dollars or so, they are. Um, um, if that, I don't, I don't, I don't even know that price exactly. But you know, uh, the, that around that price, under three hundred bucks, you. They're, they're, they're actually, they sound pretty good. They're not bad. I mean, they're like you know, they're it's a, it's a, it's a cool amp, and and you know, I know, um, I know the guys at Boss, and I know the president and stuff, and and you know, they've worked hard at getting these sounds. Um, and they've done a good job at it, and, and I, I give them kudos for kind of turning the company around and making some cool products and some cool effect pedals, new effect pedals that they've, even if they've reissued them, they've given them a new twist right. and stuff, and, and, they, and they made it great, like the DD500 delay, and, and the, uh, the, it's a fantastic delay, mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the, you know, the Waza CE2 chorus is great. Um, and uh, and and you know all the other ones that they've been re redoing and reissuing, but with a new twist. You know the whole Wasacraft series. That's been a great. Those have been really good, and, and it's good to see that uh, a company like that can really make some quality products and 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 make some good stuff. I was gonna, that was going to you know? be my opinion as well. I was going to say I have a Boss Katana sitting uh, 100 watt it's pretty in. cool it is I, I have it sitting in my living room and uh whenever i feel like cranking that up you know i throw it i throw it on it's different than a tube amp there's no doubt about it but that amp is definitely in terms of the best it's solid usable. state yeah it definitely is usable there's no doubt about it and uh we will have uh mr yoshi ikigami and jeff slinghoff on the show so that's great point. i really i, I want to have them because they're uh, yoshi's great and uh um, uh, and he's been doing great things, you know, like cool, cool things with boss since he came back as president and stuff. And, uh, uh, uh it's great. I totally support them for that question on the, the Katana. Does that have, uh, something in common with the, uh, the role in like the cube or the artist thing, whatever with the plug-in voicing modules and stuff? 
Well, I think I think ultimately I think ultimately they made the the that originally the Blues Cube with the plug-in module, and right. then they made that that bigger amp, um, with also the plug-in modules. Oh, okay. I think the Can Cantana um was made uh, as a lower cost amp. The, those those like that those the Blues Cube wasn't too much, but the the other one was you know worth a lot of money. You know, like it it was yeah, going it, for a lot of money. But the like, um, the mod. Cantana is definitely on the budget. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like the two fifty right. I mean, what are the price ranges of those, uh, well, Mark? You know, I mean, I paid for the one. Uh, I, I got a one twelve one hundred watt, and I paid less than three hundred bucks. I mean, it was like two fifty yeah. tops. So, so I mean, like you know what? If you need if you, it. it it's got cool effects in it and it's got good delay and you know, mm -hmm. it sounds, sounds really good. And, and I think, uh, I think that's a, it's a really good amp. I mean, um, for, for what it is, you know, like if you want a little practice amp at home and you want to play or you need like some sort of portable backup amp, it's not a bad backup amp unless you got your tube amp. You mm -hmm. want to take, you need a $250 or $299 dollar amp that you can just bring just in case anything happens and that you can get by with. I think it's fantastic. I, I think it's a, a good product. It'll get you by. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be my yeah, first oh. choice for a live live show. No, but, no, not yeah. first choice, but but it'll get yeah. by. And I know a few people that do like a lot of cover gigs and things like that, where they do a lot of the stuff and they need something portable and like go straight to the PA and listen that and then they use that and it, it, it works really good for them. You know, it's yeah. not bad. You know. So I was going to say the Marshall code amps are kind of okay in the price range, but you know, I haven't tried those I think yet. The Cantana, I think the Cantana might be better. Yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't tried the code, but I, I actually, in just reading some stuff, people have said the boss seems to be better. It, may, it makes me want a Cantana just for, uh, my bench amp, you know, like, um, I have a little bench amp that I just test pedal boards through and things like that. And, mm -hmm. and like, you know, just something that you can plug stuff into and see if it works, you know, basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's it's got a great clean, and it also has an acoustic setting on on it as well. So someone brought this up, which is uh really I actually have an amp that is built off a of Dumble circuit. So I'm curious what you guys thoughts are. Uh, someone wants to know any any thoughts on Alexander Dumble and and his amps. I'll raise my hand. Um, Go ahead. Alexander Dumble is a kind of a mad genius. Um, he, um, your your clones of the Dumbles really don't uh, justify what he can do, so to speak. Um, all his amps are like fine tuned for the player. You know, they're they they were always made for the player specifically. Mm -hmm. that particular person and his hands. And I've seen Alex, Alexander, um, do some amazing things with, uh, with amps, and they sound incredible. Um, I'm not saying every Dumble amplifier sounds incredible because, again, they were voiced for every individual player. But I've seen him take a uh, pile of parts – and turn them into magic. Mm. Um, he's very, you know, anal retentive about like testing output transformers and and testing uh, individual parts and 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 each side of the tube and and every little aspect of it. And he makes a fine tuned little machine out of whatever project he's doing. And um, that that attention to detail really adds up in what I've heard him do into being uh, something really special. I don't think a clone gets it. Mm. Um, a, a clone will simulate somewhat the, the, the amplifier he made, but unless you're really dealing with all the same parts and, and really he made it for the player. So... It's kind of out of the question. I mean, it's like every amp was tuned for the player. So unless you're the same player, it's you're not getting the same amp. I've heard some Dumbles sound amazing. I've heard some not sound so good. But then again, I didn't hear them with the original player. 
Well, I was going to say, because when, so, when, when it switches uh, hands to a different player, like Steve Ray Vaughn, he probably wasn't the original guy that that amp was yeah. built for. But for some reason, it worked for him, right? Yeah, I, and, and I think um, – Let's just put it this way. He really knows what he's doing. And um, and I don't doubt any of his theories or his – he really puts the time into really analyzing everything. You're talking about analyzing all your circuits, George. He's analyzed, you know, every capacitor and every little tiny thing in there. And it, it's really like I've talked to him before about it and 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 – it's really fun to listen to him talk to talk about it because it's he's very into it, you know. And he and it, it's like it's going to cost you a lot of money, but it's very. <laughs> he's, and you might never get it, but uh, it's he's he's uh, I, I like I, years ago. I think it was at a Nam show or something. He took a, a little like tweed. Um, he built a tweed mojo tone kit at the time and but meaning he took the basic parts of the mojo tone kit that they had that he kind of selected and then tested and tweaked and tested and tested the tubes and everything and by the time it was done that thing sounded so incredible i mean it was just amazing and it was like a tweed deluxe or something it was it was it was it was nothing like that special Hmm. It wasn't using any components that were super fidelity or super special, but he tested everything to such a degree that the end result was just magic. Wow. So, so yeah. I have to confess, I have not played the double. Wow. Well, you know what? You might not like it. I mean, it, it's... it's, it's um, Again, they're tweaked for each individual. So unless you get the magic dumble that kind of works with your DNA, right. uh, um, it's tough to – it's a certain sound, and it's not necessarily for everyone, you know. I, I tend to like his actually Fender modifications that he's done better. Um, I've heard several uh, modifications he's done to Twins and Pro Reverbs and – and and like uh, basements and uh, and even a Marshall um, that have been like just stellar. I have a few clients that have them. You just plug into like he made the blackface twin sound stellar, like where it would distort and be like really cool, like but still work in the stock fashion. You just turn it up and it would just distort in this beautiful way, uh, unlike a twin. And so is this optimizing the way each gain stage is cascading into the next? Yes. It's optimizing that. It's optimizing the, the gains of the individual preamp tubes. Mm -hmm. It's optimizing every stage as it's cascading into each other Yeah, and giving you that end result. That's something that I'm really uh, – started with the Metroplex, now with the Superplex more, analyzing the old 45 – watching and with the analyzer too how you can see this so clear as day you you put in a signal and then you you're seeing a bunch of static readings like okay when the signal is 200 millivolts at the input jack the the second gate state gain stage is clipping this amount this is clipping but then you start making that input signal dynamic and you see what it does at 100 millivolts and 200 and 300 and 400 and start to see a picture of how things are interacting, how the DC voltages are shifting in the gain stages and how when this gain stage sags down a little bit, the harmonics in that stage are peaking up. And when I say that I'm scratching the surface with this thing, that's kind of what I'm referring to is learning how to use it to test and really quantify and archive this stuff so I can come back and apply it later and go, okay, I know when the second gain stage is clipping just the top of the signal this much and this harmonics building up, it fits in the bigger picture like this and stuff. And it's just, it, I mean, the really the depth that you can go to with that is 
I, it's almost like I'm starting over now from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> Wish you never had it. <laughs> it, it yeah. <laughs> I could have slept at night. I could have, you know, just built products that I was happy with that I wouldn't. Yeah, sleep. right. Now now you're yeah, you're screwed. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. But now but now at least everyone will just like but you know, get your amp and then uh, you know, make a profile of it on their Kemper and <laughs> and and then return it. You can't fight it. You might as well make the profiles yourself or, you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah, but that's not a bad that's a idea. That's a whole other story, yeah. <laughs> One, we can have another three hour discussion on that. So I have there's another room on the other side of the shop full of recording gear and awesome mics. I've got an old Neumann, I've got Royers, uh, all this cool gear, and I never have time to turn it on. Hey, I'm sitting actually in front of my cool gear myself at my shop at right the- now. And I have, you know, an Allen Smart C1 bus compressor that, you know what, I turn the light on every once in a while on it just to see that the the meter still works. Um, I have a a Brent Averill API uh, mic preamp. I got a Maris mic preamp. I have a dangerous D-Box. I have an Apollo. Right. I have an old 1176 sitting here. (laughs) And you know know what gets done on it? I listen to YouTube videos through it. (laughs) Yeah, because, uh, you know, it used to be I used to have time to mix some things, and that's what I would love to do. And uh, yeah, I love that and uh, now I have no time to do anything I, I, I other to- than work six days a week and go home and watch a little, uh, a tiny bit of television at night, uh, hopefully something good because I <laughs> like to get lost in something. <laughs> By the way, if no one has seen Goliath on Amazon, that's a fantastic show. Oh, and uh, it, it should it should it should be watched uh you can binge watch it really easily it's eight episodes uh, we did it was sunday to monday and it was done um, <laughs> <laughs> um highly recommended billy bob thornton it's killer um so there's my plug for him for no reason but um so and now i've got these ten thousand dollar studio monitors right and all my recording stuff, my desk and everything was in storage for years, you know, for some of it for a decade. Like I could have sold it then, not paid storage fees and bought it new now. Uh, mm-hmm. I had these barefoot monitors mm-hmm. and before we moved into the new house a couple of years ago. I had them set up on connected to the TV in the living room. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> My kids were growing up. They're watching, you know, SpongeBob and Nickelodeon and all these little on barefoot monitors. <laughs> yeah, these ten thousand dollar monitors. Awesome. We moved to the. They new didn't house. know how good they had it. <laughs> oh my God. They didn't know how they good they had it. No way. Oh yeah, and a huge. Uh, I've got a you know a, a giant Mackie subwoofer hooked up and stuff, and like so when when guests come over at the holidays, we put on uh, the Polar Express or something. Yeah, you know, and like, turn it off like the house is shaking, and it sounds like a train driving right through the living room. You know, so, you, you know what you got to tell me. You got to tell me the the brand specifically of the bed in your guest room. Oh, uh, I think it's a Serta. Well, I know, but you need to get me specifics. <laughs> that that bed is fantastic. We have so we have a king size in our bedroom, Chris and I, and. Once in a while, we just go sleep in the guest room because it's so comfortable. Yeah, huh. I want to know specifics yeah. on that mattress, right. man. So you, you got to peel the you peel the covers off and read the label. <laughs> me, okay, I'm not joking. Actually, I, I actually want to know because I need to actually replace my mattress because it's killing my back. I, honestly, I think literally that one killing came, me. Uh, I think it was from Big Lots. Honestly, was it Big Lots or I thought you said Costco or something? No. Uh oh. Sorry, I have a I have a friend who gets Paul? on Friday nights and calls me. Yeah. <laughs> Paul? yeah. That's like me, right? <laughs> so, I, I will find it. It's either a Sealy or a Serta. It starts with an S. Okay, well, just get the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> it's always hey, you know what? It's like you know what? You know, beds are a crapshoot, right? So they are. Oh yeah. It, it's like 
you going to try them at, at, at the – first of all, I'm not spending $3,000 on a bed. I just can't. Um, uh, second of all, you go and you try them, and you think it's okay until you sleep on it. And then you're like, it takes okay, a my, my back is really hurting me now. I just yeah. like, this is not good. You know, this is not good. And so I have a mattress I've had for a little while, and it's just like, it's, you know, it was okay at first, but it's not good anymore. And it hasn't been that long either. So, and I'm kind of like, ah, oh, fuck, I got to buy it again. Um, but you look at reviews, and the reviews are just fucking awful on everything. I mean, it, it's just, you know, you, you, you look at them and you're like, hey, this has got pretty good reviews. And you start reading them and you're like, oh, maybe not. Oh, shit. Okay. More, more people go and take the time and energy to write a bad review when they're disappointed well, yeah. than they are. But everyone's you know, disappointed right? about everything. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, no, they are. They're disappointed about everything. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how good the restaurant. It doesn't matter how nice the bed. It doesn't matter how nice the car. It doesn't matter that someone's got some ass fucking thing to complain about. Because <laughs> they mean, have a venue. Because they have a venue now to complain about. Well, uh, I yeah. mean, you know, it, it, it could even be like, you know, hey, uh, you know, restaurant reviews are really funny. I always like look for the one star after. You know, it's a four and a half star restaurant, but there's always one star. So. You, know, you have 500 reviews, and it's a four-and-a-half-star restaurant. Well, that's pretty good, right? There's always the one star, and it's always like, well, you know, I felt my chair was a little uncomfortable. <laughs> right. Really? I mean, Dragging isn't it down. about the food, really? I mean, it's about the service, too. Okay, I understand that, but but your chair was uncomfortable. Okay, so it was a hard chair. Okay, a lot of new restaurants have kind of – Less than comfortable chairs, let's shall we say. But the, you know, but the how's the food? I want to know how the food is if you're going to go for a restaurant review. That's what I want to know. Maybe the service, okay? But you know what? If the food is good enough, I can deal with the bad service. I can, to an extent, and I, I'll do that. And the other thing, <laughs> it's if if you go to a high end, you know, go to a restaurant where you know you're going to spend fifty, sixty bucks a person. Uh, yeah, on an entree or more. more. Yeah, or more. And like us. Well, you never told me what you spent in Detroit last month. So oh, I, I didn't know. tell you. No, you didn't tell me. I didn't tell you. <laughs> Four hundred dollars. Oh. So. <laughs> Plus tap. Plus tip. Chiba's on me next time, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so. Every, I mean, I go to places with a great uh, high-end kind of a whiskey shelf and everything, and without fail, I, okay, well, uh, what are your single malts? And they go, well, we have Dewar's, JMB, you know, and they list all these blended scotches, mm -hmm. and I'm just like, oh, okay. You know, the funny, the funny thing is the restaurant we went to, that night we had a particular, shall we say, interesting waiter. Um he was colorful, yeah. He was colorful. Um, I liked him, but he, he was colorful. He didn't necessarily know what was on the menu uh, or, no. or or what was at the bar. Um, God, no. The, the funny thing is that the other time I went before on that same trip, um, the lady that knew everything on the menu and everything behind the bar, and she was spot on. So... I guess his color, you know, his colorful character uh, made up for uh, maybe some of it. Uh, yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> but, sometimes, uh, you know. sometimes food can make up for the poor service, but, you know, if the oh, service no, no, is no, real. No, 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 no. Like, it definitely can. I mean, there's, there's a Thai restaurant in Los Angeles that um, is notoriously slow. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, uh, it's in Hollywood. Uh, it's called Jitlada. It's some of the most amazing Thai food I've ever had in my entire life, and I'm a big fan of Thai food. Um, but uh, it's notoriously just painfully slow, especially when it comes time to get your check. Oh. Um, yeah, especially when it comes time to get your check and get out. It's like, where did the waitress go? go? Yeah. <laughs> she disappeared. She's gone. She never comes back. Um, 
and that just doesn't seem right because you know you want to get the people out the door and get them to pay, right? Right. Get them out the door. Get them to pay. Get them out the door. Uh, so, uh, but it doesn't matter because the food is so amazing that you can put up with anything. Mm -hmm. That's how good it is. I mean, like it really is that good. So you're just like, okay, whatever. I'm. I know I'm gonna have to deal with this, and this is the way it's gonna be. And you just kind of in your head before you go, you know, you're just like, that's eh, gonna take yeah. for a fucking ever. <laughs> if you know that going in, you just prepare for it. Yeah. And manage your expectations. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it, it's funny though, you know, like I, I took you to that restaurant, uh, the Great Ghost, when we were in Detroit, when recently, and uh, it's a crazy food renaissance going down there. It's it's going downtown. It's crazy. Yeah. Um. It, it it's like the, the the chefs that are opening places and the and, and the uh, what's what's going on and what's happening is like amazing, like better than most places in the entire country. It's, and it's that, crazy. It's in a place where uh, just a year or two ago it wouldn't have been safe to be there after dark, or maybe some, in some cases even <laughs> exactly I, exactly. I mean, you should see you should see the Selden Standard. That's in Cass Corridor. And, yeah. and 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 you literally you're like looking around there's a couple of abandoned buildings and then there's this nice restaurant right there and you're just like huh okay <laughs> <laughs> no it's it's, it's 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 fine you know um oh well, hey, look at this george uh your girlfriend is telling me where the mattress is from <laughs> oh <laughs> chris 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 came up here and texted me Nice. Uh, wait, no. Message me on Facebook. I think. <laughs> I don't know. It's somewhere. Something beeped at me, and I started <laughs> reading it. Um, yes, it's on Facebook. There we go. Oh, she even took a picture of it. Wow, that's service. Mattress, mattress is from Art Van. What's Art Van? But I don't know. Uh, hmm. It's a mission base furniture place. Oh, seal. Oh no, Art Van. Okay, Sealy. Oh no, there it is. Light, light. Uh, the picture's upside down. <laughs> Let me turn the iPad the other way. Lighthouse plush Euro pillow top. There we go, Sealy. All right. Done. There you go. <laughs> They're done. Be sold out next week. Sold. I am so buying one. That's done. <laughs> nice. Well, I think we've uh, we are at, are at a three hour mark here. Which is uh, a that's pre pretty pretty amazing. That's an, uh, and we've got people who are signing off saying goodnight, but we've got a lot of great interest. A lot of well, great. Was there was there any like uh, any other little quick questions we can answer in the next five minutes? Yeah, because sure. we really veered off the whole. Because uh, we really sort of veered off into nowhere land here for people. I so Dave, I'm just like, I think e even if they're not on anymore, at least they can listen to it later and find out after. They complain that the show is three hours long. <laughs> Brett Brent Harmon wants to know, question for Dave Freeman, what's your favorite audio switcher? C-A-E, Voodoo Lab, R-J-M? All of them. <laughs> okay. No, um, uh, they're, you know what? They're all different. Um, C-A-E makes great, really professional products. R-J-M makes a really good all solution that works really well. Um it depends on your application. So I use a switcher whatever for whatever seems to suit your application best. There's Voodoo Lab switchers, there's Boss, the ES8, there's the, the RGM, there's some solutions from Custom Audio Electronics, um, and there's several others also. But How about the, uh, like the Amp Pete, those boxes? Well, Amp Pete's an amp switcher, so. Uh, we're just talking about pedal switcher kind of, I think, oh, that they're talking audio. about. Yeah. Um, yeah. There was there was one other question, Dave, um, and I, now I'm freaking drawing a blank. What was it? Uh, Scotch. Yeah, See, <laughs> and, and a long week. Let me just tell you. Um, yeah, I can't I can't remember what it was. Um, but here's one other one. Uh, what what part did pickups play in, in all of this in terms of the sound? Oh, holy shit, tons. That originates um, pickups, yeah. It's and the whole have, chain, you know. It's we the whole haven't chain. touched on that, right? It's the whole chain. It starts from uh, 
the the guitar, the guitar woods, how the guitar is put together, how the pickup shapes the tone out of the guitar um, and pushes the front end of an amp or doesn't push the front end of an amp. Um, uh, pickups play a huge role. I mean, they, you know, they, or you can get radically different sounds out of an amplifier just from the uh, the heat of the pickup, the brand of the pickup, the kind of the pickup. Um, mm -hmm. Is it a single coil at a P90? Is it a, a, a vintage humbucker that's 7.5K? Is it a, a humbucker that's 8.3K? Is it a humbucker that's 9K? Or is it a, like a JB that's 16K? Um, none of them are bad. They're just different. All right, Dave, are you using proprietary, you know, your own pickups, the uh, weight Yeah, stuff? in our... No, in our guitars, we're using uh, ones we I wind with Grover now, okay. um, which uh, which are uh, we have three different heats, but currently we're just using two of them. Uh, in the vintage T guitars, we're using a, like around a seven point five, seven point eight wind for the bridge. Um, the necks around seven point five. Uh, that's it's it's definitely more open and vintagey and stringy, uh, and then the on the new Cali guitars, the the more um, California hot rotted, so to speak, guitars we're using, they're more like eight point three or eight point four. They're not super hot, um, but they're a little more pushed. But we do have one that's about nine k also that we just haven't used in anything yet. Um, I like the open stringy pickup, you know. Uh, I, I like to hear there, – there, there's a great example of the tone uh, of the – like the Cali guitars and stuff on, uh, on YouTube. All the footage from the Steve Stevens solo tour from Europe um, is um, – he's using that guitar a lot on that tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it really – you really hear what the, the, what's happening there. Uh, and some of the footage is fantastic, and and you really hear the stringiness of the pickup, and and the, you know, you know that 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 VH thing, you know, that that stringy, yep, cutting but stringiness, almost like slight bit of single coiliness to the humbucker. Mm -hmm. uh, I I really like that. So there's uh, some coil offsets we do. On the pickups that make it uh, make it have that quality to it, uh, and and you know here here's the thing. So Steve used this guitar on this tour for the first time. Um, he got the guitar. He tried he tried it at rehearsals because he um, he was playing music from his entire career, and a lot of his career he was using like kind of a super strat with a with a Floyd um, kind of thing. Uh, when he, he had his old Charvel that he used to use years ago. And so he wanted to try the guitar because, uh, you know, the, the Nags wasn't right for everything because it's more of a Les Paul-y kind of guitar. Uh, so he tried the guitar at rehearsals across the street at Mates. And, man, he was just like, this sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love how this sounds. And, uh, and, the, and he goes, the whole band looked at me and goes, Holy crap! What's that guitar? That's awesome. <laughs> uh, and so he was using it on mostly Atomic Playboy stuff and the and, and the older stuff that he he used kind of a Floyd style guitar with, and um, and for and and Steve's pretty honest with me. And for him to say, "How do you like the pickups? How do you like this and that?" He's really like he tries every pickup known to mankind, even though he has some with a bare knuckles. Um, and he's like, man, they're great. They're fantastic. So I'm like, okay, I'm done. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, he's going to tell me if it's not. You know, it's, it's like he's not going to tell – he's not going to give me bullshit. He goes, it was great. So Are they hot pickups or are they rather uh, – No, no, the PFE wine, like, you know, not hot. Like 7-8, 7-8. But nine. they sound really good, man. They, they sound you – know, you know how I knew they were really good is when I plugged them into my new Marshall I got from uh, – I think on on the on the uh, comments, uh, Reza there, uh, Reza was on our comments, and he said, uh, "I used to have a Marshall. <laughs> I used to have an old Marshall." And I go, "Yeah, that that's the one he just sold me." And thank you, Reza. And uh, 
Uh, but I knew the pickups were right when you can plug them in a vintage Marshall, and it sounds right. That is the thing. I like when you try pickups into a distorted amp, high gain or anything. A lot of them sound fine. You know, it's it's like you're just kind of covering it up with the gain. Um, but when you plug them straight into a, an amp that has to like breathe, and 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 you have to drive it and you have to attack it, um, that that is when you know if the pickup sounds right. If it sounds right into a straight old Marshall, then it's right. <laughs> no, That's what I have to say. Yeah, hmm. fifty-nine basement really is the uh, is the true litmus test for pickups for me. Yeah, yeah. And actually, for uh, because I'm a Les Paul guy, if you're there's so many pickups that the neck and the and the bridge don't really balance out that well. And if you yeah. when you switch pickups, you feel like you want to tweak the EQs on the amp. And if if they really are passing the muster, that amp will show it. And if they're not, it'll show it even more dramatically. Yeah, when when I was doing pickups for the neck pickup, I was really trying to not have that overly fat, dark, muddy neck pickup. Yeah. You know, I wanted I wanted the humbucker to sound almost like a big single coil. Well, in the in the neck too, and, you, you know percussive and you want to be able to play rhythm on the neck and switch to the bridge yeah. for the speed and stuff and uh a lot of times what i'll do is get a bunch of pots and measure them and you wind up like in a paul with the humbuckers you do like a 500k for the bridge volume and do 530 540 550 depending on what you get <laughs> but do the do the higher value pot in the neck and then you it gives you some of the clarity like the bridge has mm. and the hundred that tends to tame the bridge a little bit. And it great, great. Fun. Try to do that in production. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. Uh, yeah. Hey Dave, we have a couple questions here uh, asking if you'll ever plan on selling just the pickups. Uh, we have plans to offer the pickups as an aftermarket um, deal. Uh, it's it's coming. Get, give me a minute. Just trying to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we have to create the packaging and stuff. I mean, the pickups exist, so I mean, we just have cool. to create the packaging and stuff. So the P90s and the pickups, and the, and then the uh, there'll be a hotter pickup also that I'm gonna do, uh, which I haven't totally like tweaked yet. Um, so uh, you know, the, the single coils also actually because. There's going to be another guitar that's going to come out that's uh, the Vintage S, which is a vintage-style Strat um, with, like, uh, a pickguard and uh, single coils and uh, humbucker and more of a vintage uh, uh, bent metal saddle bridge and stuff. So there'll, there'll be that eventually also. Hmm, that's great news. That's yeah. great. I mean, we, we've got to keep going. I mean, we're, 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 like, dedicated to keep kind of going with the guitars and – um, so there, there has to be some different models that appeal to different styles and different people, you know. Very cool. Um, all right, so how about we take one more question? Make it a doozy. <laughs> Make it a doozy. <laughs> uh, all right, so does the old Marshall Hiss come from carbon comp resistors? The old Marshall Hiss? Yep. No, not really. No, it comes from the amp being on ten. <laughs> there you go. I mean, honestly, it comes from the amp being on ten and it being a very bright amp. And and uh, the guys who run the presence control high, you're going to have a lot of hiss. I yeah, mean, it's just a bright, really noise. bright. But the the misconception, uh, a lot of old Marshalls don't have carbon comps, or at least not in the places that make a lot of the hiss happen. Right. But because those uh, the pyre resistors were brown and brownish red, a lot of times they get mistaken for carbon comps, but they're really carbon film. Hmm. Just like the a lot of the caps that um, look like ceramic were really uh, silver mica caps. Silver, um, the big angular ones and square ones, yeah. Silver yeah. Mica. Silver mica, although not like modern day silver mica, but um, no. 
Mm, no. no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's what someone's got to do next is they have to make uh, a modern day equivalent of a Lemco Silver Mica. Is somebody is out there is crazy enough to do it. You know? Yeah, I know. I actually talked about this, uh, the capacitor company about that, but mm -hmm. uh, they, they don't make that kind of cap. All right, yeah. one more. Sorry, yeah, George. Go ahead. That? What were you Go saying, ahead. George? Uh, it's a different process to make a silver yeah. money cap than it is to, to roll a foil and fill yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's do one more question because this one seems interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> Rich Mod 2 Larmar or Trainwreck Type 3 Type Master Volume? Any oh, preference? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I thought George prefers the Rich Mod 2. See, I thought this was technical enough that we would just end on something completely technical. You, you have yeah, no idea what any of this means, right? I have not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay, I figured you would. <laughs> so the uh, the post phase inverter master volume, it's been around for a long time. Uh, my understanding is that it really came into prominence uh, after Craig Anderton wrote an article about it in the mid to late seventies, like in Guitar Player magazine. <clears throat> and the premise of the PPI master volume is, in an old Marshall, uh, you have two gain stages, a cathode follower, tone stack, and a, and a phase inverter before the power amp. And if you put a master volume before the phase inverter part of the circuit, you are, when you turn it down, you're losing the part of the overdrive, the clipping that happens in the phase inverter part of the circuit. So the logical change was to let's move the master volume later in the circuit. And it turns out that to do that, you have to use a dual pod. You can't accomplish it with just a single pod. And so now you have several different ways to accomplish putting a dual pod in the phase inverter to get the clipping of the phase inverter part of the circuit and then feed that to the power amp. Mm. And there's different ways to do it. They really accomplish the same things. And uh, to be honest with you, they sound probably 95% or more the same. Uh, I've actually found that a better improvement or uh, that I prefer if you use uh, this two watt mil spec precision electronics pot, which is like 30 bucks versus using the, the $2, uh, the cheaper pots, because when you have two, two sections of a pot, it's a dual pot. So both sections, if they don't track the same, if the taper mm. isn't the same between the two sides, then everything gets off and it just kind of screws the whole signal. Uh, so if you use the, the expensive military spec pot, I really think the differences sonically are neg negligible. Uh, but there's a caveat that on the Metro Amp forum years ago, uh, there was a really brilliant tech named Larry and there was a really inquisitive, really fantastic guitar player named Mark, Mark Avery. <laughs> and these two guys would banter on threads about everything you can think of in, in a Marshall type circuit. And Mark would feed questions and in, he's so inquisitive that he would feed questions and then Larry would answer them. And Mark would say, why is this this value? And Larry would answer. Mark really wouldn't understand the technical reply. And then he'd go, well, but what if I change this? What does it do tonally? And then, uh, this is another one of those things, pages and pages and pages of thread later. Oh, yeah. Uh, they came up with, well, we should do it this way. It's the best of everything. And we'll call it the Larmar. So it's Larry and Mark version of a post phase inverter master volume which which was a train wreck master volume with added resistors with some safety resistors built so they go well what if the pot fails then your bias voltage goes away and your tubes run off and you blow stuff up so they go well that's the reason to the technical reason for putting these safety resistors in there and and voila you have the larmar uh, now, 
because of the way it's in the circuit and the way that this dual pod is feeding directly to the grids of the output tubes. When I was selling kits to do this, it was, uh, there was propensity for, if you don't wire it a certain way, or if, if your lead dress isn't great, it can destabilize the amp. And so for general purposes, <coughs> excuse me, I found it more reliable and safer to just do the standard type two post phase inverter master volume. And when you coupled that with using the expensive pot, I didn't, the, the, the tonal gain wasn't really there. It was neck and neck. So if I have a preference, it's based on really on practicality and uh, safety and, and making it accessible to everyone because the Larmar version is just requires a little more technical expertise to make sure that things aren't oscillating and it's safe. Yeah. Shielded wire. Yeah. The mandatory. Yeah. 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 Okay. So there's there's but, a long-winded history and explanation on my stands. But yeah. let's throw this out there. The problem with that whole master volume, the post-phase inverter master volume, is the fact it takes the feedback network out of the equation. So yeah. meaning your presence knob then ceases to exist. Um, so the amp, then in turn, your, your amp's yep. very bright um, yep. until you get it up louder. Uh uh, there's ways to compensate for that some of that stuff, um, but it's it's kind of a losing proposition in a lot of ways. I mean, like I'm sure you with the Metroplex. I know we talked about this before when you were trying to do the post phase master kind of thing uh, originally. Uh, I gave up on it years ago. It it's just like it's a solution. It works sort of, um, but man, in the end, it's kind of just screwed. It just doesn't I, sound right. I spent a couple of months solid just trying to make a post-phase inverter master volume work. And I t what, didn't I tell you? I called you. I go, what are you doing? It just doesn't work. It just won't work. Yeah. We, I mean, and we went round and round. Yeah. And, I, you know, I'm going, I can make it work. I can do, you know, <laughs> compensate. And you gave up. <laughs> no. Ultimately, you know what? I did. I finally, I go, all right, I've tried everything I can try to make it work. We're done with this. Here's a standard master volume, and make one of the sound things, around it. Yeah, and and so I did a couple of things to make a standard master volume work, uh, as well as it does in the Metroplex. One of them is frequency sweeps through the the circuit up to that point and through to the speakers at every level. So here's master on point five. Here's one. Here's two. And then comparing the frequency shape and then coming up with networks that compensate. So when you turn the master volume down, these networks kick in to put the, the to restore the frequency curve. Hmm. And that helps. And then the in the actual negative feedback circuit in the amp, there is some tonal shaping 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 happening there. <laughs> shaping. Some scotchening happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so scotching is happening. Yes. Um, no, so if you do tonal shaping after the master volume, it takes away some of its effect yeah, because it's yeah. not doing everything that happens before it. So that was those two things combined make for a master volume that really. Uh, I, rem I, I remember at the time you were doing. I the time you were doing it, I'm like going. I gave up on that a long time ago, man. I, I, I would suggest you do the same. <laughs> and, and I reached out some, to some other tech friends and everything. And, yeah. you know, the bottom line, post-phase inverter master volume, great with two gain stages. As soon as you put a third gain stage in, it falls apart. Yeah, and, and you know, it, 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 and, it, and it sort of works okay with – with the plexi but you know honestly just buy a a a, a, a power station mm. I, don't I bother with the master just buy the power station dime it out and go. there you go <laughs> you know, when you have that type of amp it's because you're addicted to that power amp distortion yeah crank mm -hmm. non-master volume thing so, as soon as you crank down the post-phase master the mids go away mm -hmm. and the Field compression print. goes away 
And as soon yeah. as you do that, it's like done. We have to go, okay, well, why? Why yeah. fight it? No. I'm going to have to try out Power Station. That sounds very cool. Freight, right? It's great if, 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 you, if you're going to collect a few uh, vintage amps, you know, you want to get something that, you know, uh, you want to get an old Marshall or, you know, high water or something. It's fantastic mm -hmm. for that, you know. Or even like a, a, even a champ <laughs> or right. something. It's cool. It's cool because you can – or a silver tone, like an old little tiny silver tone. You can there's – there's a couple silver tone amps that exist. Um, I, I, I the, the exact model, I'm not exactly sure, but the, the ones where the controls are on the side of the speaker, I'm sure George knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th that, that amp, if you just dime it, dime it up, it sounds glorious distorted. Um, but it's not very loud. It's really quiet. It's like a 10 watt amp or something. Right, and right. if you put that in the power station, you get a fifty watt amp. <laughs> awesome. I used to have a, uh, I used to have a fifties champ. So, you just yeah, fifties champ is a great example, like totally stones thing. But if you wanted a little bit louder and a little more robust, I mean, there you yeah. go. That's you a, know, that's pretty cool. It's, it's cool. Uh, it's a cool. It's a great thing, especially if you're going to collect anything old. I think it's cool, and you can put your delay pedal in there if you want, you know, and stuff. So, very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I think if I don't go, I'm going to explode here because I'm going to have to run to the restroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that, um, I, George, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time tonight to come on. It's fantastic to have you on. Oh, uh, no thanks necessary. This is awesome. Yeah. And um, if you don't mind, tell us where people can reach you and get your products. Uh, it's still at metroamp.com it's also metropolis.net and uh our phone number's on there you can call us chris usually picks up the phone and i'm usually running around manic in the shop and you can email us uh sales at metroamp.com and uh we we hope to do some more of the bigger shows uh, i'm gonna i'll probably go to nashville for we're gonna be there and uh yeah i'll probably go down and we're uh, there yeah, yeah you I'm, will be there uh, so I'll just be kind of, you know, loiter, panhandling out of your booth or whatever. <laughs> uh, we're, fine, we're, at, we're we're toying with the idea of uh, renting a studio, like on Saturday or something, like getting a, just booking a day, and setting up amps and having just stuff set up and people can come in and <clears throat> play the stuff in a studio environment and uh, you know maybe order some food in or something. Yeah, just uh, that's cool. Real low key, you know. Just casual. You know, you you might be able do to something. do that at um, my friend's shop, XTS Pedals. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Greg Walton and um, his partner. Uh, maybe I'm just like throwing. Okay. I'm throwing that. I'm throwing them to the wind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, sorry if you don't, guys don't want to do that, but I just threw that out there. <laughs> It's all good. We're looking at different places to see what's not booked and to see what the day rates are like. And I know a lot yeah. of engineers and, and guys, studio guys in town. So, uh, yeah, we'll come up with something. And uh, it'd be cool to do that, even if we just have a few amps. And we just kind of hang out and talk shop, play a little bit. Um, we, we talked about maybe having backing tracks, and you could play the amp along with backing tracks, you know, mm -hmm. stay in the room, whatever. So, <clears throat> well, we're, we'll try and be t in town there and just uh, we've got good products. I want to just try to keep them out there and let people play them and let the amps do the talking, you know. Uh, yeah, well, I'll be there. Okay. Dave Black's going to be there. Awesome. Um, uh, Joe Morgan, uh, yeah. Brian Wampler. The whole crew is going to be there, I guess. Avi. Avi's going to be there. <laughs> So drink like fest. Um, It'll be yeah, fun. Exactly. It should, should be fun. And and Mark is apparently going to be there. I will be there. I already booked my flight and everything. I am there. Awesome. I, we we booked our hotels. We didn't book our flight yet. Oh okay. Uh, well, uh, get me on the list, Dave. Uh, I got to get you on the list for the pass. Yeah, no problem. I could do exhibitor pass. So. Yes. Thank you. That Perfect. that that won't be an issue at all. Beautiful. 
I can't wait. And George, we look forward to seeing you there. We'll have a we'll have a couple more drinks. Maybe I'll bring Absolutely. the bottle. And uh, again, thank you guys, uh, Dave. Thank you. Any closing thoughts on the show? Uh, anyone that uh, didn't get a uh, question answered, please email us. Um, feel free to email. If it's for me, email me at freedmanapps at gmail.com. If it's for George, I think he already gave his contact info or it's on his website. Uh, and if it's for Mark, well, I don't know where to email Mark. Uh, tone talk. Tone talk. <laughs> Mark at uh, gmail.com. Tone talk mark at gmail.com. So, yeah. um, if you have a technical question for me, uh, please send it to Keith at redplateamps.com. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And uh, overall, uh, if, you, if you have a two problem, please email uh, George <laughs> Metropolis at gmail.com. Uh, no, velvetgeorge at gmail.com. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. All right. Well, thanks, guys. It was great. Uh, Dave and I, will, we will be back for episode three soon. Uh, we will well, announce, yeah, we'll announce who our upcoming guest will be in the next week, uh, and we'll figure that out. And um, again, George, been awesome having you on thank you so much uh you guys check out metropolis amplification check out george's stuff he knows what he's talking about these is great products um and uh you guys have a great night hang on one second i'm just gonna close up and uh everybody who tuned in tonight right now we still have 44 viewers people are hanging in three hours in uh troopers thanks everybody you guys rock thank we will you see guys thank you we will see you in a couple weeks you guys have a great weekend, and uh, you two guys hang on one second. Good night, guys.